How's it going? It's great. It's a lever. I guess I try to keep it. You know, there's cranes okay. all over this town, but none of them seem it's to be fangled. private industry. All state money. And the clinic. I know. The clinic is I find like drunk crazy sale. things in it. Thank God for their money. They're building a $15 million lab right across the street from my office. Is that right? I couldn't be any happier. I had, I had somebody get really upset about Jacksonville Road. It's actually the gym's The north side of Old Jacksonville Road. Is that area? Uh, uh, you know where the, where the clinic is going? Uh, we didn't hear it. I didn't hear it. So that's a pediatric center or whatever. Yeah. They spent like $40 million. Yeah. Yeah. Who's like a bitch about that? Yeah. They just, I don't think he's one. That's a good neighbor. That's a good bitch. But you know, that is a question. The September 20th, 2022 meeting of the City Council of the City of Springfield, Illinois is called to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Clerk, if you please call the roll. Will do. <laughs> Alderman Redpath. Here. Alderman Gregory. Here. Alderman Williams. Here. Alderman Fulgenzi. Here. Alderwoman Purchase. Here. Alderwoman DeCenso. Present. Alderman McMiniman. Here. Alderwoman Connolly. Present. Alderman Donnellan. Here. Alderman Hanauer. Here. Mayor Langfelder. Here. Mr. Mayor, a quorum is present. Thank you. The uh, first item on the zoning agenda is docket number 2022-036 for the property located at 850 North Dirksen Parkway. Petitioner is Indurjit Singh as contract purchaser, present zoning classification B1, Highway Business Service District, section 155.033. Request the zoning relief of conditional permitted use pursuant to section 155.033 C7. Conditional permitted use in the B1 Highway Business Service District 155.200 taverns and a variance of section 155.200A2 taverns to allow a tavern within 100 feet from the nearest lot on which there is a resident, residence, church, school, park, community facility, or daycare. Uh, regarding the history of this pro property, granted relief in docket. 2009-031 to allow a CPU for the sale of packaged liquor and a variance of section 155.210 to allow the sale of packaged liquor through a drive-up window on the condition that food prepared in a food service establishment as defined in section 95.001 is offered for sale on the property. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation is approval of the requested CPU provided that Number one, only package liquor sales in accord with zoning case number 2009-031 are allowed and no tavern open pour sales are allowed in the drive through window. And number two, the tavern is limited to the existing building footprint approval of the requested variance. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the recommendation of the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff. Chair will entertain a motion. Um, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to... Uh, Motion for approval as recommended by both commissions. Second. we we'll move in second to uh, recommend approval as approved by both commissions. And second, any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. Zoning passes, nine voting yes, none voting no, one voting present. 
Next item on the agenda is docket number 2022-038 for the property located at 1425 South MacArthur Boulevard. Petitioner is Walt, Walt Thor Properties, LLC, present zoning classification S2, community shopping and office district section 155.031. Request a zone relief of conditional permitted use pursuant to section 155.031C4. <coughs> Residences located on the first floor and section 155.182 multifamily residences in certain commercial districts and variances of sections 155.056B minimum required lot area per dwelling unit to allow a, for a duplex on a lot containing 3,588 square feet instead of the 6,000 square feet required by code and 155.091A required accessory off street parking spaces residences to allow zero accessory off-street parking spaces on the lot instead of the two required by code. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation is approval as submitted. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the recommendation of the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff. Chair will entertain a motion. Motion to approve the commission recommendation. Second. second. Been moved and second to accept the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation. Second, any discussion? <coughs> All those in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. The voting is now open. And the zoning passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. And that concludes our zoning portion of the meeting. At this time, Chair will recognize Treasurer Busher for presentation of the financial report. Thank you, Mayor Langfelder. The corporate fund in the month of August had a beginning balance of $62,027,444. We took in total receipts of $16,454,031. We had total disbursements in the month of August of $12,977,335, which left the corporate fund with an ending balance in the month of August of $65,504,140. Mayor Langfelder, of that balance, your ARPA fund ending balance included in that was $25,890,694. This concludes my report, Mayor Langfelder. Thank you. Uh, Chair will entertain a motion to approve the financial report. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. We have a, a couple of presentations. First one is from Sinclair Broadcast Group, Emily Lynch. And Scott Dahl is going to give an intro. Thanks, Scott. Director Dahl. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate that and appreciate your time tonight. We'll, we promise to be brief, uh, but with the first day of fall this week, uh, we wanted to give you a recap of our summer uh, digital marketing campaign. We also have a very busy fall convention and winter convention season as well, so we want to get ahead of that and provide you this information and the results of that summer digital marketing campaign. Uh, with me tonight, as the Mayor said, Emily Lynch with Sinclair Broadcasting Group, so glad you're here. As you'll recall, we did an RFP uh, earlier this year, and Sinclair Broadcast was the highest score in that. Um, just some of those uh, details where we looked at target cities, which Emily will cover. We had a target demographic. Again, Emily will cover that. We had different channels, uh, display, retargeting, Facebook, Instagram. Again, this is a digital summer marketing campaign, primarily domestic. Um, we had minimal requirements. 500,000 over the top commercials, video 200,000 impressions, display 500,000 impressions, et cetera. Um, we had a reporting system and uh, we had uh, all content was produced by the media outlet. So quite a bit wrapped up in this digital uh, marketing campaign and I'll turn over to Emily at this time and she'll give you the details. Thank you. Feels like summer today, so a good day for a recap. Um, so thank you so much for your partnership for this last summer campaign. We targeted areas of people that were family vacationers, adults 35 plus, road trippers, interest in Abraham Lincoln, interest in history. We targeted cities like Milwaukee, Madison, Wisconsin, Cedar Rapids, Davenport, Iowa, Chicago suburbs, Moline, Illinois, Indy, Paducah, and St. Louis in Kansas City, Missouri. In comparison to the 2019 campaign, you had over 100,000 more OTT commercials. That's just what we call those non-skippable streaming commercials that you see when you're watching TV. You had over 200,000 more display and video impressions than 2019. And your average open rate of our emails that we sent out was over 18%. And at Sinclair, we guarantee an 8% open rate. So that did great. 
Your goal for the Facebook campaign this year was to generate more clicks to your posts and visits to the Visit Springfield page. This resulted in over 26,000 more clicks to Visit Springfield website um, and page first this summer in 2019. So we can watch an example of the what somebody that living in maybe Paducah has seen um, in their non-skippable streaming ad. <clears throat> I think it exemplifies our town well and an interest for everybody. This is a 15 second ad that you might have seen if you were living in Moline on Facebook. So that commercial, as you can see, is geared towards more of the history buffs and focuses on the rich history that Springfield offers. This is an example of one of the email sends that somebody has seen. Um, the best clicking image was that hero image at the top of the history comes alive and everything that that program has to offer. Thank you so much. And that was a recap of your summer uh, 2022. Any questions? Good job. Questions? Thank you. Thanks. Very good job. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks, Scott. Yep, yep, go ahead. Real quick, and thank you, Emily, and thank you, Sinclair. Um, and by the way, that resulted for us this year. The numbers are in through August. Uh, we had pre-pandemic levels this year uh, in revenue and travel expenditures. Uh, we actually, we're running right now for the year to date uh, a record-breaking average daily rate. And uh, in August, we ran $109 average daily rate. We've never broken $100 uh, up to that point. So um, we're also got a, a record setting year to date average daily rate. Occupancy is just a couple points down. So again, we've returned to pre-pandemic levels uh, on all levels. And I think part of that is this digital marketing campaign. Thank you. Great, Alderman Donla. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Director, just a real quick question. Do you, and I know you have this, but is there a way we can get kind of an analysis of the, by zip code? In other words, see how successful the marketing is based on uh, whether it's hotel rooms or at the historic sites or what have you, what kind of data is available? So, so we're utilizing Placer AI. The city purchased that, that data, that analytic data. Uh, we can do that for events. We can break it down by zip code and tell you where people are coming from. Uh, we've been doing that for events throughout the year uh, so far, and it's been proven very, very valuable. I'm not for sure if, can you guys break it down by zip code? Yeah, Emily? we can break it down so we can kind of match the two together and that would be interesting. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we can provide that. Great. Great. Uh, Alderman Gregory. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, Director Dow, do you plan on bringing back the uh, Legends and Tourism thing? You know I was going to ask we, that. I knew you were going to ask this, I, I and think we do. A, I think it's a we good do. thing. I think it really um, uh, spurs a friendly competition between Great. people who, who host the events in our city. You know, as a past winner of it, I, I, I like it. In 2019, we talked about bringing that program back in 2020, and obviously we know what happened then. So yes, absolutely, uh, that is on our radar, and I do I agree. I think it's a great event, uh, both locally and and to uh, recognize our event planners and really just our, our citizens as well. So absolutely. All right, All right. look forward to it. Alderman Redpath. Director, uh, good job on the presentation. I, I thought it was great. Um, do, do you have uh, any numbers on the hotel occupancy rates? We do, yeah. I can provide snapshots uh, to the council if you want, but absolutely, yeah. We've got uh, not only monthly, uh, quarterly, and year to date as well. Uh, right, currently we're running 53.4 percent year to date uh, in the city, and uh, we're running 96 dollar average daily rate, which again is a record breaking rate. Awesome. We've never ran a 96 dollar rate. In and that's every every hotel, or how do you break that down? Uh, that's so. That's taking our. Uh, 3,975 rooms we have in the city, okay. uh, and that's every available room every day. Uh, so uh, meaning that uh, if we continue to run that 53% occupancy, we'll uh, rent over 800,000 room nights in the city. And obviously, uh, that's an enormous jump from the 20% was projected from like last year. Was that correct? 
That, that's absolutely correct, yeah. And we're running pre-pandemic levels at this point. Thank so uh, we're ahead of the curve. Thank you. Awesome. And uh, do we have a, the numbers for the Wyndham? I think that's what he's getting at. <laughs> we have How many room, what's the percentage? Well, I didn't want to so say we, that, Well, we no, run, we, we receive citywide. We receive citywide, so we can't break it down by right. per property. So, uh, you know, that's a combination of all of the properties. Uh, so there's properties that I, I think are running, you know, 95%. I think there's properties that may be running 30%. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Brad Fletcher from the Illinois Finance Authority <clears throat> talking to us about the PACE program. Thank you. And there are a couple of ordinances uh, being impacted by this program, so we appreciate it. Uh, good evening, and thank you for having me, uh, Mayor, uh, City Clerk, Alderman, Alder Women. Uh, my name is Brad Fletcher. I'm with the Illinois Finance Authority. I've been with the authority for a number of years. If you're not familiar with the authority, we're a state agency, but we're self-funded. Uh, so taking myself as an example, if I don't make money, we don't pay payroll, our own bills, et cetera, et cetera. So we're motivated. Uh, the mayor asked me to uh, stop by today uh, for your consideration under your consent agenda is an ordinance to create a PACE area, uh, somewhat analogous to a TIF district, if you will, uh, as well as establish a PACE program on a pilot basis for two properties in particular. Uh, one is 607 East Adams, the other as I understand, is one North Old State Plaza. Uh, so if we have enough time, I can step through our PowerPoint real, uh, very quickly, uh, perhaps answer any questions you have, and I'll stick around as well uh, during the um, uh, agenda uh, debate to, to follow through. So of course, uh, CPACE, what is CPACE? It's a new economic development tool available here in Illinois since uh, roughly 2019 uh, after we cleaned the statute up. Uh, CPACE stands for Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy Financing. And under state law, municipalities can create these PACE areas uh, at the request of uh, owners and developers of commercial real estate uh, so such owners can make energy efficient improvements on their properties at a lower cost than would otherwise be available than conventional financing. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. And the reason we're here today and discussing this today is because this, of course, serves a public purpose. And that's what the ordinance uh, frames for uh, the community at large. Uh, energy projects must be permanently affixed to the property. There is a list here, a bullet point list of uh, your typical examples of what we see day in and day out uh, uh, through cold, uh, cold phone calls. Uh, electrical charging vehicle uh, stations are eligible. Uh, energy efficiency improvements, roughly anything that would save utility costs will qualify <coughs> with very limited exceptions. Uh, to the extent a property would like to install solar panels or renewable energy improvement, those type of improvements will qualify. And then uh, uh, the last two there, resiliency, that's microgrids, uh, batteries, generators. Um, that's more applicable to properties in a flood zone, if you will, around the Mississippi. You know, they have those concerns, uh, uh, whereas not so much here. Uh, and then water use improvements. Of course, uh, uh, the last uh, presenters uh, talked about hotels. As you can imagine, the hospitality industry is one of the largest users of this type of financial product. Water use, uh, water conservation uh, is a, a huge expense for them on a monthly basis. So to the extent they can install low flow fixtures, uh, those type of measures that of course saves them money and that's why they're very interested in this type of product. Uh, next slide, please. So as much as we dress it up, this is through and through a special assessment, something each of you are familiar with. What's special about this, and will always be special about this type of special assessment, this will always be voluntarily requested. This is not the city of Springfield imposing special assessments on properties, commercial or otherwise. These will always be financial transactions that are voluntarily requested. And today, for your consideration, there are two properties uh, initially. Uh, so eligible pro properties that fall within the PACE area voluntarily enter into the contract, and then a bond issue uh, funds that project. Under Illinois law, there are two type of entities that could issue those bonds. The city of Springfield could undertake that financing and then incur the related compliance, or the Illinois Finance Authority, my agency, can take that burden off of your plate. And that's why we're here today, and that's why we're motivated to see these projects come to a successful conclusion in funding. Uh, these, doc these are documented through an assessment contract, as you might imagine, again, voluntarily requested. Uh, the municipal assessment of contract will reflect the business terms and conditions of each particular financing. The lien runs with the property, so as a special assessment, it's tied to the property not necessarily the business operating within those four walls. And that's really important. Energy efficiency improvements 
need a longer runway for the savings to materialize. And because you need a longer runway, banks, commercial banks, this really isn't their wheelhouse. Most commercial banks will go out seven years, 10 years for their best clients. CPACE is often 15 years or longer. And that's a lot of retained risk for lenders. So the special assessment allows this, uh, um, I should say, the municipal assessment contract allows the special assessment to transfer from one property owner to the next over a period of time. They could also pay that off during a commercial real estate sale, a private market solution. But it's that seamless transfer of that special assessment that really gets the lenders motivated to fund these projects. And of course, it's also very motivating for the property owners to know that this uh, uh, is recorded against the property, not necessarily their balance sheet, per se. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so some of this I've already touched on, especially with respect to the difference between CPACE financing and traditional bank financing. But this is a low-cost alternative. This is a new product. This is why it's uh, the first time many of us are hearing it today. Uh, but it's a successful product. This has been in the market for roughly 10 years. Uh, the overall CPACE financing market is roughly about $2 billion. Uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, 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 contrast, the um, uh, CMBS market on any given day is about a half a trillion. Okay, so this is still very much in the early stages. But the nice thing was in 2019, we were able to study all the other states, what they did well, what they did not do well, and develop the statute here with best market practices. And that's how we ended up here today. Uh, next slide, please. So under the statute, uh, the, again, state law, uh, there are some sponsor requirements for any potential commercial property owners. Again, today, we're limiting this to two property owners who are requesting it initially. It's our hope if everything goes well, we can come back and have a discussion for future commercial properties. But these are some of the underwriting requirements. Uh, just to um, run through these real quick, any particular property that requests such financing could not have any delinquent taxes, any existing delinquent special assessments, water or sewer charges. Um, the properties cannot be in default or in bankruptcy proceedings over the last two years, et cetera, et cetera. These are all controls at the state level to mitigate anyone getting ahead of themselves with respect to financing these improvements. Um, on the next slide, we also have some lending considerations uh, from a capital provider standpoint. Um, under state law, energy efficiency improvements, should anyone voluntarily request such financing, are capped at 25% lean to value, meaning no one can overextend themselves over the, the value of the property. And that's important. You'll find in most states it's 25 to 30%. The General Assembly took a more conservative uh, stance and, and made it 25%. But if you consider commercial mortgages, they roughly usually go to 75, 80% lean to value. That roughly leaves you with a gap of 25 to 30% that you need to finance or utilize cash out of your own pocket. And that's really where CPACE comes into play. It uh, allows uh, property owners to finance these eligible improvements at a low cost over a longer period of time than they would otherwise find available in the traditional uh, banking market. Uh, furthermore, uh, there's an energy audit that is required. Uh, that's the second bullet point on page seven. If we could go back, sorry, thank you. Uh, and energy modeling is required, so the property owners um, have all the information in front of them before they commit to something that maybe they can't afford, which is very important, that's a control. And finally, mortgage holder consent is required. Uh, if there's any existing mortgages on an existing property, they will be at the table for every future financing, and that's important as well uh, to make sure that uh, everything is up to speed. Um, and then just real briefly, I know I've taken a lot of time today on the next slide. Again, I touched on this earlier, the legislative history. Uh, this bill was first introduced at the state capitol in 2017. It was somewhat dead on arrival. Uh, my agency was not an author to the original iteration of the statute. However, in 2018 and 2019, we made some amendments. In 2019, frankly, we rewrote the statute top to bottom. And since that time, we've been very effective at closing and funding uh, these transactions across the state. And the reason that we've been good at it, uh, next slide, if I may, is the authority has a lot of experience in the fixed income market. And what this financial product needs is market access more than anything else. Again, as a body politic and corporate created by the laws of the state, we've historically served as the primary conduit issuer of bonds and notes for projects undertaken by private sector borrowers. Uh, as I alluded to, the General Assembly made some amendments to the statute uh, to include the authority and provide that market access. And at this point, uh, we're uh, strategically working with municipalities, cities, towns, and incorporated villages, 
Counties also have this opportunity to develop these programs. Our marketing preference to date has been municipal entities for a variety of reasons. And so we created our state support model. This is uh, page 10 of the PowerPoint. And this is uh, really the key attributes of what we prefer to offer the market and we know the market needs. Uh, three big points here for us are standardization. As you can imagine, there's 1,297 municipalities in the state of Illinois. If you are a capital provider from the West Coast or the Sun Belt, the last thing you really want to do is negotiate legal and financing documents with 1,297 different cities. What they prefer is that their Big Mac tastes like a Big Mac no matter where they are in Illinois to, to bring it home. Uh, efficiency, obviously this is what I do day in and day out. Uh, so there is a bit of subject matter expertise, if I may say. We also have a very built-out staff that deals with bond <clears throat> issues for private actors day in and day out as well. Um, that's important. And finally, affordable. Uh, I can say uh, um, uh, with full confidence that we are cheaper than almost all county existing programs. Uh, it's quite frankly a badge of honor of mine. And we prefer to uh, market to municipalities because you're closest to land use and zoning use. And that's really where we find harmony in our public policy. And so the next slide is a municipal opt-in. That's what we're doing today. We're not opting in the entire city of Springfield and its uh, jurisdictional boundaries. Instead, we're going to have a program of two pilot projects. And again, if everything goes well, we'd love to have the opportunity to come back and discuss this again. But what the ordinance uh, importantly does uh, that's under your consideration today, and we'll spend a minute on this so it's clearly understood, uh, it includes a finding that the financing or refinancing of energy projects is a valid public purpose. Again, I, that was at the beginning of the slide. Um, it approves a form of assessment contract that is attached to the ordinance in the program report. That's a standardized document uh, for the Corporation Council's benefit. They don't have to review these time in and time again. The only thing that will change for each deal is the schedules and exhibits. So the body of that contract, which is quite lengthy, is standardized. And that reduces your staff costs as well. And importantly, it creates the territory, uh, as I've said a number of times. This is just for two pilot projects, the PACE area, who are voluntarily requesting this at this time. Um, and the program report has been provided, and I believe it's been uploaded into your, uh, your system for your consideration. Okay. Um, and then funding. Uh, this is where uh, IFA comes into play. We are the financial conduit issuer of record, not the City of Springfield. Therefore, the City of Springfield does not incur any compliance or accounting obligations over the life of the loan, which can extend up to 30 years. It's Illinois Finance Authority paper, not the City of Springfield paper, so that administrative burden has been obviated. Um, and our board, of course, meets under uh, compliance with the Open Meetings Act. Each lender that we approve for our program is uh, uh, debated publicly, as, as you are doing here today for your ordinance. And uh, we have standard forms of uh, uh, financing documents, indentures, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, that the market has reviewed, the market has approved, and we've closed deals with. Uh, so as I alluded to, you know, the, the benefit of using the authority, and thank you for having me, is that we do this day in and day out. A uh, couple case studies, just so we can um, uh, see some actual results. On page 13, uh, one of my first uh, transactions, CPACE transactions, this was in the city of Beardstown, uh, a few hours south of here. Uh, JBS has a, a global pork processing plant there. They wanted to install a solar a voltaic farm. They utilized CPACE, a special assessment. And as you can see, they were able to achieve um, significant energy utility bill savings. Uh, next case study, um, a little farther north in uh, suburban Cook County. That was Highland Park. Uh, that was a multifamily uh, development. Uh, again, they utilized CPACE uh, to achieve um, a lower interest rate and longer term financing. Uh, they reported to us that their watering, water savings was uh, 576,000 gallons a year, and that equated to uh, only $13,000 in savings. But if you look at the energy utility bill savings, um, that's 62,000 a year. So that's significant for a multifamily property, and that's why we do this. Uh, I have a couple FAQs that always pop up, the most important of which is what types of commercial properties qualify. Uh, this is um, state statutory uh, language. Any privately owned commercial, industrial, non-residential, agricultural, or multifamily, provided that it's five or more units, would qualify for this financing. Does that mean that every potential commercial property owner will come to terms with a lender? No, but by and large, the lenders are interested in these type of properties uh, going forward. Um, as far as billing and collecting, and this is important because this is a municipal 
program, albeit pilot. Uh, the lenders in these circumstances at the municipal uh, uh, assessments bill and collect these themselves. So you are not imposing any burdens on either the Spring Springfield Treasurer or the uh, Sangamon County Treasurer, which I think is important as well. We're obviously not trying to um, increase, increase their staff time. As far as default remedies, just as you expect with a conventional financing, a foreclosure is the remedy for the lenders in a default scenario. So that's a brief overview of CPACE. Uh, I recognize that this is a new economic development tool. I'll be hanging around to answer any questions, or I'd be happy to do so now. Well, thank you. Alderman Donna. Yeah, thank you, Mayor and Mr. Fletcher. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's always good to learn about new economic development programs, especially in downstate Illinois, where there aren't that many tools available to communities like ours. Um, just a just a cut to the chase. Uh, this almost seems, I'll just say it very bluntly, too good to be true. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, it seems like a. I mean, it has a the purpose of the the purpose of the financing mechanisms and the improvements for the private uh, owners and even public institutions. What is there a risk for the city? No. No risk to the city. No, you are, so the property Count me owner, in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, at the time of consummating the transaction, the assessment contract is the uh, equivalent of a mortgage. Uh, the city of Springfield is completely indemnified by the property owner. And because you are not undertaking the financing, a state agency is, that is recorded on our books and records, and therefore we incur the related compliance. Um, contemporaneously with the execution of that assessment contract, Alderman, uh, authorized officers that are detailed in the ordinance also execute what's called an assignment agreement. And that transfers that assessment contract as collateral to the authority within seconds. And therefore, the authority steps in and fulfills all the duties and obligations under that ordinance for the financing. And because of that, there is no risk or liability to the city of Springfield itself. And, and can you help me? Uh, just two other questions, then sure. I'll, we'll move on. But. Uh, does the prop does the area that is designated the pace area does it have to be contiguous in other words no. okay it could be yes. spread throughout the community yes. so really what we need to do is uh, uh, have a one pager that describes the types of programs that could be available and, and see if businesses slash yes. institutions in our community need them. Yes. what is is there a minimum dollar amount uh, statutorily no uh, from a state agency standpoint we have no minimums economically it's been my experience, professional experience. Uh, projects that are under a million dollars become tougher to pencil out, if you will. Um, I will say in CPACE's defense, obviously not all financial products are for all projects, of course. Um, the, everyone is striving to get to those smaller deals because that's really where the volume is. That's where the lenders can make the most bang for their buck. Uh, because most projects are on the smaller side. Um, at this point, it's obviously a lot easier to finance larger projects because they can subsume the fees. Uh, but it's been my experience that under a million dollars makes it a little bit harder to pencil out. And frankly, if I may say, to be blunt myself, it's a little harder to get the capital providers interested. Yeah. At the end of the day, if the capital providers are not at the table, there's not much I can do. I'm simply a conduit between the property owner and the lenders. If the lenders are not interested in a project, even if it does pencil out, there's, again, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat limited, uh, being that I'm not a lender myself. Well, thanks for being here. Appreciate yeah. it. Alderwoman Conley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you so much for this. It, um, this is a really exciting option for us. Um, just a quick question, and it may be too much in the weeds for now, and if so, we can get talk about it later. But what do you do in a situation where it's difficult to get a, a pre- modification energy assessment like I'm thinking we have a number of buildings downtown I've got one very particular one in my ward that have been empty um, sure. almost stripped of, of everything inside so energy usage over the last couple of years has been negligible to nothing how can you was can you yeah accommodate um, that yeah thank you for the question um, oftentimes in my uh, professional capacity, I receive phone calls from uh, real estate owners, developers who would like to undertake these type of improvements to save money or because they're interested in, in the green attributes that this espouses. Um, we do a number of things. One, we give them the list and contact information of all the capital providers that my board of directors has approved so they can work with them. <coughs> the capital providers, the lenders in this market do have their own technical in-house expertise to look at a project. And it's been my experience, and I mean this, most of the time when a developer calls and says, you know, I, I think I got a project here that will garner interest, 
it's about a million dollars, I tell them quite from the outset, you probably have 1.5 or 2 million. The lenders are really good at this because this is how they make money. Uh, so they'll offer that type of um, technical assistance, for lack of a better word, um, just as part of their marketing efforts. Uh, we also are in early stages of collaborating with the University of Illinois at Springfield, um, CDAC. Uh, it's an acronym, S-C-D-A-C. -C, I, I can't recall what it stands for. But they're, they're really good at this, too. They perform en energy audits uh, for prospective projects. And we look forward to fulfilling, I should say, building out that relationship. So it's, it's, not, it's not an obstacle that there hasn't been energy usage in the building for a couple yeah, of years? Yeah, I, I would. I, I think the, the bigger obstacle there is, is what would that particular commercial real estate owner like to actually build? Right. Okay. What is their intent? And once that intent is known, then the lenders will say, you know, we think we can save you some money with these elevator controls. We think if mm -hmm. you use um, these, this type of uh, roof tile, this will save some money. And it's, it's usually a bit of a, a discussion, not so much a negotiation. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Alderwoman Purchase. Thank you, Mayor. Alderwoman Conley just asked the first part of my question, and you just brought up something. This presentation has grew my appetite. <laughs> I represent the downtown, and we have a lot of vacant buildings. So how do we determine what's the limit on the projects that you will do? Uh, when you mean limit? How many projects can go at one time? Oh. Um, is there a certain cap per year? Uh, no and no. Right, so this is, uh, for all intents and purposes, but for the public mechanics that are in, under discussion today, the special assessment, um, the execution delivery of the assessment contract, this is uh, conventional financing. This is a private actor working with a private actor. The IFA, the state agency, is a conduit in between. And to avail the financing to those attributes, we simply need a little interplay with municipal government. There's no statutory cap on the number of projects. There's no statutory cap on how much could be financed um, to provide market context. The largest CPACE transaction in the country, to the best of my knowledge, was $110 million in California. Uh, I believe that closed last year. It was for a hospital. Um, I, on the smaller side, we already talked about, usually those are uh, about a million dollars uh, to get the lenders interested. There's nothing saying that they couldn't go lower. It just needs to be significant interest. Um, did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, as far as how many we could do at one time, uh, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. Uh, but these are typically institutional investors, uh, so they're quite methodical. Um, usually, uh, from the time I get a first phone call to the time we close, depending on how long this part takes, because this is really the first part. This is the engine on the train. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually six to eight weeks. Um, I, at any given time, I'm working on four or five transactions a month is probably the, the best answer I could give. Yes, and um, you brought up a concern about the elevators. We have, and sorry to let me correct myself, I share with Alderman Gregory, but I represent a large portion that has those vacant buildings. Sure. And we have a lot of those buildings who the elevators are just really, really, right. they have been and dilapidated for years right. now. Right. And so need a lot of help in that area. So I will be contacting you along with Axon probably for a meeting with the mayor. Okay. I look forward Thank to you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, on the uh, projects less than a million dollars, uh, say we'll stay on the topic of downtown, there's numerous buildings. Is there a way to uh, for a developer to lump several buildings together to get over that threshold? Or can you have an umbrella organization that would have multiple <clears throat> owners? Underneath that, uh, where you could do five buildings, possibly, or yeah, more than that? To your answer your question, if a lender got comfortable lending for all five properties, uh, it would be the lender's discretion, I probably is probably the best word, to cross-collateralize and secure that financing with all five properties at once. Uh, a good term for that would be a pooled financing. We have those mechanics in place. Uh, to date, no one has requested it, but we, we have that all ready to go off the shelf. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much very for helpful. having me. Next, uh, we do have another one on consent uh, that's here to uh, give a brief up update as GR Consulting, uh, Larry Luster and Art Turner and others. Thanks for coming. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you, council folks, for allowing us to be here today. Mr. Mayor, thank you for, an allow us, for allowing us to present. I'm gonna have Art pass out a few handouts just to kind of outline uh, what we're gonna be discussing.
So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, first, again, thank you all for uh, considering us to represent you before the state of Illinois. It's been uh, an honor and a privilege to, to represent the city that uh, most of our team grew up in, and, and we have a new transplant here, Art Turner, who's been here for a number of years <laughs> also, and he's, he's just as honored as I am to, to represent this great city, the capital city. Um, I also want to introduce uh, Sarah Jimenez and Brian Wojcicki. They've been, you know, really important to our team as far as gathering information. They have a wealth of knowledge around the city, and, and Sarah's messaging has really helped us get the message across to legislators um, in a way that they can understand and comprehend it because of her previous experience. So I just want to make sure that I highlight them as, as part of our team. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and kind of dive into it. Um, you know, we're, we're here to have a discussion about, you know, bringing us back on board. And I think over the, over the course of the last year, you know, we've done a lot of good things. Um, you know, when we look at CWLP and the carbon capture um, program, that the, the carbon capture system that we have, that's the one of the only ones in the world, I believe, maybe one of, of two, um, we were able to bring in um, not only the, the, the reappropriation, but also a new appropriation for an additional $6 million to make sure that program can further develop and be the model for the rest of the world. Um, we also um, worked with the, through the, uh, the Electronic Vehicle Illinois Act. Um, you know, Springfield's really unique having its own electric, co electric company, electric cooperative. I, I don't know how to, how to classify it, but that's just set here for Springfield. So it positions us to move faster and, and be more prepared for, for new developments like the electric vehicles that are being, um, being advanced throughout the country. Um, so we positioned Springfield to really take advantage of some of those programs. I know there's a recent um, a recent RFP that went out, um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the further developments that CWLP and the city of Springfield are able to do. Um, one thing that, that's not on here is uh, when, when we talk about law enforcement cameras and, and making sure that we can track um, folks who are, who are trafficked uh, throughout the state, throughout the city, uh, make sure that we have eyes on, on, on some of those folks who may, who may who we want to make sure that we watch and, and we're capturing so we can have um, a way to make sure we, we identify those people and can and can rescue people or if there's some drug trafficking things like that make sure that you know we're 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 positioned to also have eyes on that so we were we were able to position the city of Springfield and Sangamon County for that matter to, to participate in that program um, another re, the, the reappropriation for the armory 100 uh, 121 million dollar reappropriation on um, the $15 uh, re, uh, reappropriation that finally got signed off on uh, by the by the Board of Trustees uh, on July 24th for the for the purchase of the the property I believe that's along uh, is that Adams Street or is that a street over I can't Warfield, remember Washington Washington so yeah so we um, you know we we'll work with the University of Illinois to kind of facilitate that process move along a little bit faster so you all can start seeing some results immediately on um, the community community support and investment the three million dollar investment um, for community development and violence, violence prevention and over two point one million dollars um, di in distribution from the American Rescue Plan Act um, to city nonprofits and schools and health facilities. Um, you know, we work with, under the leadership of, Doris, uh, of Senator Turner and Representative Shear, we were able to position Springfield to get some additional dollars um, to address violence prevention and community development. Um, $250,000 for the mid for the mid Illinois Medical District, and then $150, $150 million um, for the Downtown and Medical District Master Plan through the RISE grant. It's a grant through, I believe, uh, DCO, is that correct? Uh, yeah, grant through DCO um, that, that you know, will provide Springfield with some additional dollars so we can further grow and develop. Um, the next thing I want to point out was one of the initial projects that we worked on, which was the Enos Park TIF and the Madison Park Place TIF. Um, we were able to work with the mayor and, and, under, and again, under the leadership of, of Senator Turner and Representative Shear, we were able to help um, you know, foster, a, foster a solution to ensure that um, everybody was satisfied in what, the, in what we were trying to achieve, which was further community development. Um, lastly, you know, some, some items that we're, we're going to continue to work on are um, gaming. I know there's an appetite to bring a casino to Springfield, so still gathering information and working with legislative leaders around that concept. Uh, pinch reform, uh, something that we're working on um, you know, with, the I, with the IML um, and other interested um, cities who are interested in finding new ways to, to, to manage their pension debt. Um, an additional fund, you know, an additional uh, funding requests. Um, we're still working with, um, you know, trying to find a way with with um, with with the state to figure out how we're going to manage the, the the North Mansion block and bring that that entertainment space and make it live for folks. We're still working on that in, in broadband expansion, something that was identified, bringing more broadband access as we saw with the pandemic and the the access to the internet, and we saw the disparity. We recognize that we need to figure out a solution for that. So working with the state so we can bring more funding in to make sure they have access to that high-speed internet. 
Oh, and, and as I mentioned on the back page, is a, is a broader list of all the, the appropriations that the city of Springfield uh, received. Um, there's some, I believe there's a star by the ones that were new appropriations. Um, so we were, we were able, we were, we were, we were able to make good on our, our, on our investment. Great. Thank you very much. Alderman Redpath. Larry, thank you for your presentation. I'm very pleased with the results that you guys brought to us in the past year and I hope, look forward to working with you again in the future. We uh, obviously are going to look at the future right now because one of the biggest problems we're going to see is uh, pension reform. And as you know, we asked you to look into that, and that has to, we need to turn the flames up on that because we need help, and as every other municipality does in the, in the state. But um, that's, a, that's always been an a, a ongoing problem from us, and it's building every day. So we really want you to work on that. So that's, that's an issue that we have to have done. Okay, absolutely. Thank you. Alderman Gregory. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Larry, Mr. Turner, and... Uh, I, I, I'm gonna mess your, your last name up, but how are you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> Miss Sarah and Mr. Brian. Um, thank you for your presentation. You guys did a good job. Um, last week when we was talking about this, I just wanted to revisit a few things. I know you have been working on um, teen empowerment um, um, zone things. Um, and, and, and also the North Mansion, you know, Y Block. I just want to stress, you know, that, that, you know, we didn't get that there. And, you know, I, I don't know what the exact feelings are, is it? But it is a priority to us in our city, um, as well as our, our teen empowerment zone. Um, for multiple reasons, we're seeing um, increased, you know, uh, violence among youth. Um, Chief just uh, presented a uh, presentation. You know, we're up to about 17 youth that's that's you know been caught with guns and and things uh, up. So it, it, it's a you know a, a big deal. It's a it's a big thing. I, I know Auto Woman Purchase um, just has some things going on in her ward. So you know this is a total citywide thing that we want to address. Um, and, and you know I just ask that we continue to work on that so we can really um, um, sink this in. And I'm willing to meet with Senator Turner, Sheer, and and all of our representatives that represent this area to really stress the importance um, to that. So I appreciate your, your work, all of you. Thank, thank you. you. Alderman Donnelly. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and uh, I just want to say, you know, this the ordinance to extend the contract is obviously on the consent agenda. You, you didn't have to come this evening. A lot of people that when things are on the consent agenda don't come. But I just appreciate you being here and the entire team being here and the work you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Alderman Williams. Yeah, I want to thank you for coming too, but last week we was told you was coming with a report, so I was expecting you. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that you're here. And I want to thank your team for the work on uh, Pillsbury. You know, uh, thank you for, ex you know, the, the, I know it wasn't easy extending that TIF. You know, the SHA TIF has been extended to help the citizens living around Springfield, and I would request and ask that you keep your eyes and ears open for any type of funding and help on Pillsbury plant itself. As you know, the uh, environmental study is over and we got good news out of it. Uh, wasn't as bad as we thought, but it's still bad and it still has to come down. Um, so I'm just requesting of you while you're down there, if you hear anything that this may be a fit for, I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Then, uh, one other item is, uh, it's been in the news recently, is the Safety Act. And uh, I don't know if you can share any insights. Uh, you know, it's my understanding it's uh, state's attorneys have filed lawsuits. Uh, we received a letter from a political action group asking us to weigh in on uh, rescinding it, um, you know, in the middle of an embroiled lawsuit. So, and I think there's uh, provincial uh, amendments coming forward. But uh, do you know, or can you get, provide any insights with regards to that? So there's been a lot of discussion um, about them bringing this back up for discussion during veto session and possibly lane duck session if there is one. So my suggestion would be to, um, to be mindful and to pay attention to what's going on. Uh, get as much information as you can and read as much as you can about the act and, and both the pros and the cons depending on where you're at on the spectrum. Um, just get a better understanding of it and, and kind of I would suggest individually making those decisions rather than as a, as a collective because we don't know whether or not, I don't know how you all feel about the bag specifically, but that would probably be for an individual. 
discussion. I, if I may, I sure. just um, yeah. So there's been a lot of misinformation out on the on the Safety Act, and the legislators, our local legislators, have worked to provide some clarification around the issue. Um, the governor has already stated that they'd like to, and they're working on currently coming back with a trailer piece of uh, legislation to address some of the concerns in the in the Safety Act, and it's a lot around uh, implementation. There's just no real clarity around that, and all parties in both sides are able to uh, agree to that point. So I believe that that will be one of the top priorities for the veto session in November or scheduled early December, and then we're gonna have to work really fast to bring our local um, clerks and courts and counties up to speed on uh, the adjustments that I anticipate to be made behind it. But we'll keep you guys, um, the entire council updated on uh, the developments as they pertain to the Safety Act, something that's very important. So thank you for asking. Great. Hey, uh, Alderman Gregory. Just one final note that I had on my page. Um, I, I, I see here that, that um, uh, continue advocacy um, to add, you know, Springfield to the list of cities to qualify for the casino. And I, I understand that we had a um, resolution for this before that failed. And, you know, I had some conversations with different um, legislators in passing. And, you know, that was one of the things uh, why we didn't get considered. So, um, you know, I would ask, you know, um, that we draft that resolution. Um, you know, we have a lot of gaming um, spots, and if that's going to help us move, you know, to be on that list, I think um, to have all our gaming and all our gambling in one place, bringing jobs and, and revenue to the city um, would be a good thing. Uh, we just approved, approved one. Um, and, you know, we hear constant talks about, you know, more and more added and, you know, whether we're going to cap it or not. And, you know, I think uh, this is a great time to, to be on that list to, to fight for a casino uh, in the city because people like to gamble. It is what it is. I don't gamble anymore. But um, <laughs> anymore, but, um, you know, uh, we should do what people like to do. So thank you. That's my last point. Alderman, the gaming um, discussion is a timely discussion right now. It, the the there there have been discussions about for next session uh, an expansion in gaming and eye gaming. So eye gaming along with other casino locations or whatnot, but that would put us at a, a, a very high uh, seat count. It is for gambling positions in the state. So the chairman for the gaming, uh, well, the chairman for the executive committee who handles all of the gaming on the state side, Representative Bob Rita, has at this point said that, look, we're, we're kind of holding off on any full expansion talks, but we will keep Springfield included in those discussions and, and keep you updated on how that's how that's going with the game. I appreciate you. Yep. Any other questions or comments? Very good. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Chair will entertain a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the I'll September move. 6, 2022 regular city council meeting second. and approve the minutes. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council first reading of ordinances in the record of the city council meeting. So moved, Mayor. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The chair will entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council reading of the consent agenda in the record of the city council meeting. I'll move. Second. Move and moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to place the consent agenda on final passage. So move. Second. The move and second. Uh, discussion. Alderwoman DeCenso. Um, yes. I need to be a present on 392, please, clerk. Noted. Thank you. Alderman McMinnell. Uh, Mr. Mayor, there's a, um, a um, ordinance on the consent agenda 2022-384 has to do with a letter of intent regarding the jurisdictional transfer of the uh, old portion of MacArthur from South, uh, from Wabash up to uh, South Grand. And um, Alderwoman DeCenso and also Alderwoman Conley, we've talked about this. And um, um, we don't know yet what alternative uh, rebuild um, um, will be chosen. Um, Alderwoman DeCenso and I both serve on what's called the Community Advisory Group for the rebuild of Old MacArthur, and we haven't met in 11 months. And um, there is still three alternatives for the rebuild of uh, Old MacArthur having to do with which, which properties get acquired, which buildings get demolished, um, the width of the lanes and that kind of thing. So we think it may be better just to hold off on this until we know exactly what the rebuild will look like precisely. So that's our, our recommendation. Um, so 
uh, if we can get approval for that, I'll make a, a motion to hold this ordinance until we know more about the exact IDOT plans for the uh, rebuild of Old MacArthur. Second. Been moved and second to hold. Uh, discussion, I'd ask Nate Bottom to come up and make sure there's not any issues or what his recommendation is on that. Um, I'll go ahead and have a conversation uh, with IDOT in regards to that. I know that they were um, wanting to go ahead and get that done and see the commitment from the city, but we can go ahead and have that conversation uh, with them, and I'll follow back up with everybody. Thank you. So just Thank send you. it back we'll to committee. committee. Yes. Been moving second to send, uh, uh, what was that ordinance number again? 384. 2022-384. Send it back to committee. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Any other discussion on the consent agenda? All in favor of the consent agenda vote yes. Those opposed vote no. The voting is now open. Well, I'm a yes. It ain't working. And the consent Mayor. agenda passes nine voting yes, none voting no. Mayor? Yes. Alderman Hanauer. If I may, um, I'd like to move that we bring... Uh, 2022 397 to the front of the agenda to uh, got a lot of people out here that are interested in that. And okay. Second the that. motion. Yep. Uh, first, we'll do agenda number 2022 256 remains table during committee. There's no action on that, I take it. So there's a motion to uh, pull 2022 397 to the front of the agenda. And then, second, a discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is 2022-397, a resolution authorizing an advisory question of public policy for submission on the ballot of the consolidated election to be held on April 4, 2023, regarding the dis dissolving of the portion of all townships located in the city of Springfield. <coughs> Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2022-397 on final passage. So moved. Second. Second. Been moved and second. Um, Discussion before we start discussing I just want to uh, We do have several people signed up to speak. So I just want to cover uh, some commonly asked questions uh, That were shared with the council earlier um, And it pertains to this particular ordinance the first one is why is the resolution ordinance being presented again? Uh, previously we wanted to add the item to the November ballot, but the urging of the city council members It was preferred to have it on the city's April ballot Question two was what townships will be affected? Any township parcels uh, within the corporate limits of the city of Springfield? Um, and this would include, there was a list uh, that we can't go over, but it was Woodside, Kern, Gardner, Springfield, I think Rochester, and um, might be missing one or a couple others. But those are the main ones, I believe. Chatham had one, Ball, and <coughs> Clear Lake and Cotton Hill. And it says uh, there's a loophole in the state statute that allows townships to retain municipally annexed properties instead of having them go to the previously, go to the municipality's previous conterminous township of capital. Through different administrations, properties have been annexed, but uh, retained by the original township. And to date, there's 1,390 parcels. Uh, what's the purpose of the referendum? The purpose that there are annexed property owners paying taxes to townships and not receiving the services. The city provides the road services, for example, annexed properties around the lake. Upon the public passing the referendum, we will request the state legislature to close the loophole and dissolve the parcels from township jurisdictions so we can provide property tax relief to the affected residents. Question four, and then there's one other. What about the referendum that was passed to dissolve Capital Township? Previously, a referendum was passed uh, a year or two ago, 74% to 26% to dissolve Capital Township with the Sangamon County. However the, uh, however, the only provision in state statute for a conterminous township to be merged is with the municipality, which is conterminous of uh, being Capital Township was established as a coterminous township with the city of Springfield. The projected taxpayer savings at that time was estimated to be $685,000. Uh, 
And then the final question, number five, was what will the referendum cost the city of Springfield? Uh, it would cost us zero. The referendum gives our residents a voice to express their opinion on township jurisdiction and property tax relief. So with that, I don't know if the city council members have any questions or should we just go to the audience? Alderman Williams. Yes. I, you know, on this, on this issue, um, I, for clarity of, of the Ward 3 residents that are listening, so what, what we're doing here tonight is voting to ask a question to the citizens, correct? Correct. Okay, I just wanted to be clear that we're not approving uh, to, to put anything into anything right now. We're asking the citizens a question, and upon the results, then further action will be taken, like send it on to the state legislator or whatever else is required. So thank you. I just want to make that statement. Any other questions or comments from the council? The uh, first person signed to speak is uh, Carol Sutton. If you'd uh, give your name and address for the council, we'd appreciate it. And if the uh, comments could be directed to the chair, that would be great. Anybody tells you you can get over a knee replacement in four months is kidding you. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. Mayor Langfelder, council members officials elected and appointed. It's deja vu all over again. I was here three months ago, actually three months to the day ago, talking to you about the same thing. Uh, I still don't understand how many properties are involved here. And I've talked to a lot of people in the last week or so, and the more people I talk to, the less I seem to know about what's being proposed. So it's you know, it's a good thing we're going to vote tonight because then I can maybe understand it. Uh, this, it's just, it's not the way to do it. it. It really isn't the way to do it. You want people to come into the city, forcing them in is not the way to do it. I don't believe that's the way that we, are. We, we do things in a free country. I hope it's not the way we do things in this country. I know there are others lined up behind me to speak, and I will keep my remarks mercifully short. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Corporation Council can weigh in, but these are uh, parcels that were already annexed into the city. These have nothing to do with <coughs> people outside the city limits right now. And so, uh, Corporation Council, if you'd like to go over the that portion of the referendum, that would probably be helpful. Yeah, I mean, just very briefly, the... Uh, you may recall the the resolution is for an uh, to put an advisory question on the ballot. Uh, it's not a binding result, regardless of an, the outcome of a of a vote. Uh, it is to seek a, advice on a public question. You may recall that the way the annexation process works is that when this city, uh, any municipality, but in, in the, this specific case with the city of Springfield, when uh, areas are annexed, then in that uh, case, um, ordinarily the parcels would become part of our coterminous township, which is capital. However, there is a, a process um, under the law that allows the existing township to vote within the township to retain those places or those parcels in the township regardless of the annexation. So the effect of that is to the, the, the annexation to the city remains uh, in place or intact but rather than parcels going to, for example, the coterminous township like Capital, they are retained within the uh, specific uh, uh, township that they were originally. So the, the, the issue becomes one that the entire township votes on it. Uh, it's not limited to voting to people that are uh, have already been an annexed. In other words, the affected parties. So there's been uh, all the parcels around the lake have been annexed in by the city of Springfield. And then there's uh, some out off of uh, Bradfordton Road, I believe, that uh, Kern Gardner, they took a vote and they retained those parcels within the township, even though those residents or those parcels are now within the city of Springfield. Uh, what typically happens is that's the loophole we're trying to close with the state legislature. So uh, once a parcel is annexed into the city, uh, the individual would no longer have to have that uh, payment to the township. It would be dissolved. 
And that's so, what we're talking about. So we're about. talking more than 50 township or 50 parcels than 500 parcels. Right. Well, actually, the ones uh, we did take a look at how many <clears throat> parcels have been annexed in over the years that have been retained by the townships. And it does equal right now 1,390 parcels. So around the lake. 1,390? Right. Is that correct, Corporation Council? Yeah. Um, Public Works was able to, uh, th this was one of the questions one of the council members had. So Public Works uh, did put together the list that we had circulated. Uh, there are a total of, and, and again, um, this is not something that's recent. It's gone on for a long time. I think when Mayor Davlin had, uh, for example, annexed 80 or 90 parcels, I think in that instance Woodside retained those parcels. So this has been a long process. It's not something that just started. It's been more historical. And in this case, uh, Public Works is reporting that of the townships mentioned by the mayor that there are 1,390 parcels that are in the city that were annexed, but ended up staying with the uh, prior township, not uh, proceeding to be the normal process of with Capital Township. In the case specifically with Woodside, uh, it, uh, Public Works reports uh, 685 parcels that were annexed were retained by Woodside that should have gone in a normal process to capital. So would the residents occupying those parcels be able to vote in this advisory referendum? Yes. Correct. It, all city, it, it would be all limited to city uh, residents. Just the city, right? Yes. It's an advisory okay. uh, question that would go on a city, you know, city ballot like other uh, advisory okay. questions that have happened uh, in other instances. It was 680 from Woodside? Uh, it indicates, and again, I'm just reading off the information, uh, Public Works indicated that there were 685 parcels that had been annexed to the city. You know, these would be individual houses, for example, parcels, individual parcels, um, where uh, through the statutory process, there was a referendum to keep them in Woodside, not allowing them to uh, go, for example, to Capital Township. So almost half of the parcels are in Woodside Township. Of the 1390, uh, they're reporting 685 of those uh, out of the 1390 relate to Woodside. And then the rest are, I think the next larger Close one is half. Springfield Township has 468, if I'm reading this correctly, and I think Gardner Township has 150 parcels. No wonder the phone calls have been as heavy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Nick Whitfield. Yeah, I just want to address the, the council that uh, I've lived in Lake Town for 22 years, and I'm happy with what Woodside Township provides to us. They keep the roads good, uh, branches get picked up, and I just don't think, I, it just bothers me that, that, that Springfield is trying to do this. I want it just left alone. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I don't think uh, any of the parcels are within Lake Town. No. Nope. You know Corporate Council? Yeah, I don't. It, this only affects uh, parcels that are inside the city, not, you know, parcels that are not in the city. This is limited to just those that are inside the city. And the uh, reason it's important, when they go to Capital Township, then they, um, they don't pay other taxes associated with it. So it's usually a wash when we annex in. <clears throat> but if they're retained by the current township that they were in or the previous one, then uh, they're seeing a spike up in their property tax typically. Next is uh, Mr. Kenneth Mayor. Oh, Alderman McMinn. Yeah, just to repeat that, um, Mr. Whitfield, if you're in Lake Town, you're outside the city limits at this present time, so this does not affect you. This only affects parcels that are currently within the city limits. It's in Woodside, but it's not within the city boundaries of the city of Springfield. It's the uh, corporate city limits. The easiest way to, uh, uh, to understand it, do you vote in the city election? <laughs> and if you do, then you're impacted. If you don't, then you're not impacted. 
Next is uh, Kenneth Elmore. My name is Ken Elmore, and I appreciate you allowing me to have a time to speak before you folks tonight concerning this issue. Um, I had a couple questions. I have a lot more concerns, but I'm not going to even try to address those tonight because uh, I think I need to be briefed. There's other people that's going to need to speak or want to speak. But um, the first thing I would like to do is present to this board a little brief history of Woodside Township. I think it's important that that's being taken into consideration. I was really shocked when I found this out, but does anybody know how long Woodside Township has been in existence? Since 1860. 1860 was the year to formulate Woodside Township, and they've existed ever since. Woodside Township is a known entity that has been around for a very, very, very long time. And I just thought you folks should be aware of that going into this and considering a vote. Um, another thing that I wanted to speak out about was I live in Lake Town. I've lived in Lake Town for 33 years. So I'm a longtime resident. I'm also president of Lake Town Association. Um, so I kind of got two hats in the ring here. The first thing I would like to discuss and let you folks know is how much the residents out there in Lake Town absolutely, absolutely love the services that we receive and how well we're taken care of by Woodside Township. I don't think I, in all the time I've been president of the association, I've ever had one person in that entire neighborhood raise a concern or a complaint about how the services are that's being provided. That's a rarity. And, but the reason why that is is because we have a very rare circumstance. Jim Edwards, who's the president of the area, Woodside Township, he lives in Lake Town. Jim Edwards loves Lake Town, he loves Woodside Township, and he loves every resident who lives in it. This guy works 24-7 if he needs to, to do whatever needs to be done, provide whatever service that someone needs. Now, the way it generally works, and it's really great for me as a president of the of association, is if somebody from... Lake Town calls me personally, tell me what their problem is or concern. I can simply pick up my phone, call Jim, or call someone else, and get that problem resolved in 15 minutes. That's not an unusual consequence. And as a result, the service that these people get from Woodside Township is absolutely, absolutely incredible. My concern and their concern is that this resolution that you want to put forward on April 4 may in some way jeopardize that. And they absolutely do not want to lose the credible services they receive from these areas. We also have, you know, Brad Miller, who's the... Uh, on the board for Woodside Township. He's the road commissioner. He carries about nine hats. Anytime I need something done, I usually call him before I even call Jim because he orchestrates anything and everything that needs to be done, and then Jim puts his input in, and they get back with me and they say, this is how we're going to do it. It's going to be solved, taken care of. So that is something that the people and the residents of, of not only Lake Town, but Woodside Township as a whole appreciate. And I'm sure that they are not going to want to give it up. So to do anything concerning Woodside, I think would be a very, very big mistake. 
I think you guys need to really consider what's involved here. One of the things that's very important, and I know you guys are homeowners, so the same thing would apply to you that would apply to us, would apply to anyone in, in Woodside Township. The services that you receive in the, in the area in which you have purchased your home has a monetary value. And depending on the level of service that's provided to you will make the difference whether you're going to stay in that area long term or leave. I can tell you that if you went and you went out to the Lake Town area and you went and started knocking on doors and asking people, well, how long have you lived in Woodside Township? How long have you lived in Woodside Township? I will guarantee you the vast majority of these people are going to tell you, well, I've been here 30 years, been here 33 years, here been 35 years. And the reason why that is is because the incredible service that Woodside Township provides to every resident in Woodside Township cements a bond. And these people know that if they go anywhere else, they're going to lose this service, and they don't want to. And you wouldn't want to either. So that's something I'm asking all of you to consider before you put this to a vote tonight, what's at stake. Um, Another thing that I want to address concerning Woodside Township. We'll pass five minutes, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, if you could wrap it up, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll wrap it up as soon as I can. Won't Thank be you. long. Um, I'll allow it since he's speaking for the uh, a group, right? Yes. And one, one thing else I would like to mention is the one thing that Woodside Township does exceptionally well is they show great stewardship over the finances that they receive. They're not understaffed, they're not overstaffed, they're efficient, they handle their finances very well, and the money that goes into Woodside Township, those dollars stay in Woodside Township. Those dollars are spent to provide services for the people who live in that area. I'm sure these people are not going to want to be concerned with losing that. And one last thing I want to mention is when I found out about this initiative, the way it was proposed to me that, that I heard was that the city of Springfield was considering consolidation of Woodside Township with the city of Springfield. Now they use the term consolidation. This is not consolidation. I actually pulled the bill today and looked at the language <coughs> that for what your guys are gonna vote on tonight. And this is what it says. And I'm only gonna be, read part of it because there's lots of different parts to it. Section 28-5 of Illinois Election Code DILCS 528.5 provides for certification of advising question of public policy. And whereas Section 129.5 of the Illinois Township Code provides for discontinuance and abolishment of a township and that the transfer of all rights, powers, duties, assets, property, liabilities, obligations, responsibility of the township to the municipality and cease and dissolve all township, road, district, and all authority transferred to the municipality. There's also a section in there that deals with property taxes, which basically says the same thing. If if you guys vote for this, this is what you're voting for. You're not voting for consolidation. When people see the term consolidation and the way it's being presented to them, they're getting the idea that this vote, if it's approved to be put on the ballot on the 4th of, of uh, April, that consolidation would mean somehow Woodside Township's gonna still exist and they're going to be in partnership and be with the Springfield City and that they'll consolidate together and they'll be working for a common goal, 
which would be to provide services these people want and low property taxes. So that's not what the language of this that you guys are going to vote on tonight says. Yeah, it actually, says, uh, uh, what it is, uh, Mr. Elmore, I appreciate that. Two items. One is Lake Town uh, with annexations, and that's what we're talking about. If uh, if you're already in the city of Springfield, corporate limits, you've already been annexed in, that's what this will address. Or not future all annexations. Woods, but not all woods but on uh, Lake Town, with Lake Town, it is uh, a large enough um, area that it has to be voted on by the residents of Lake Town. Isn't that correct, Council? Correct. Yeah, this so, has no impact on Lake Town or really on Woodside. It doesn't do away with Woodside Township at all. It just keeps them from taxing people in the city. Well, the you're going to need to address. You're going to need and, and do. Respect. So here's the here's the how the wording is, uh, is, sir. Being, it's real, real you need quick. To address the language, the way this yeah, is being. Do you want to read the uh, question, and Corporation Council, so there's clarity? Up for a vote so, on April four. We appreciate it. This needs, okay. It just needs to have I understand what you're saying. Too. You like Woodside Township. You want to retain those services. As long as you live in Lake Town, you'll be able to retain that, unless the residents of Lake Town vote to uh, consolidate with the city of Springfield. But so you're, you're talking safe. About, you're talking about all the townships, not just. We're Lake talking Town. about the parcels within the city of Springfield, because each one of these council members represent citizens within the corporate limits of the city of Springfield. So that's what we're trying to address: are those residents that are paying township taxes? even though we provide all the services related to that. Well, there's 1,090 households in Lake Town, okay? Yeah, again, that's the reason why we cannot, we won't annex it in unless there's a desire from Lake Town because it takes the plurality of Lake Town residents to vote to well, be annexed into the city. I'm not telling you you can't do it. Yeah, all I'm I know. saying that's, is... So you made your point, and I appreciate if it. If you're going to do this moving <laughs> forward... You need to make sure that the language and the way you're going to be presenting this. Yeah, he'll read it here once uh, you wrap up here. with the language here. of the bill, yep. and it's not. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate your time. You too. You so, uh, Corporation Council, if you want to uh, read the question as it would appear on the ballot, please. Okay. Just, just very briefly, it is on the second page of the uh, resolution. This is a resolution, not an ordinance. It is to... Uh, the city, like any public body, may place an advisory question, public policy question, on the ballot uh, for uh, persons to express an opinion on. And the process for uh, presenting it or uh, uh, establishing it for on the ballot as a public question is a resolution. And the question, if it is adopted, that would be placed on the ballot, which is uh, specified in part by the statute. You can only ask certain types of questions and they have to take a certain form. Uh, so the question states, shall the portion of all townships which are located within the boundaries of the city of Springfield be dissolved and the taxes and duties thereof be consolidated with the city of Springfield to provide property tax relief and reduce the number of taxing districts? This is a policy question. It's, it's not binding. It's for then the legislature to determine of how it might be implemented. This meaning, I'm sorry, state legislature. Very good. Next is uh, Dan Smith and Cap O'Keefe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of the council, I want to make sure that you all know I did not yield any of my time to Mr. Elmore. <laughs> <clears throat> A little attempted humor here. So. Anyway, I'm here. Uh, my name is Dwight O'Keefe. I am uh, a lawyer with Brown Hayden Stevens here in Springfield, and I'm here representing Gardner Township. Uh, Gardner, as many of you know, is immediately adjacent to the city on the west and shares a jigsaw puzzle-like border with the city. Gardner's issue, quite frankly, is the slow absorption of it by the city and by law capital township. This ordinance will not solve that issue. There are two myths here. One is that it will reduce redundancy. There is no redundancy. The city grows, it absorbs the township, the township stops taking care of the roads, and the city takes over. Gardner runs its general assistance program, Gardner assesses its property, 
Gardner runs a uh, recycling program, and so on and so forth. Second, that this will somehow save tax dollars. I live in the city. Last year, according to my tax bill, I paid $34.74 to the city, uh, to the uh, taxing body for Capital Township. And that's a $21.59 reduction from the year before. And I know my corporate tax went down a dollar, and I'll give you all credit for that. But that is four tenths of 1% of my real estate bill. It just illustrates to me, and hopefully to you, the small amount of, uh, small percentage of tax burden uh, that townships represent. If the object objective here is to, as stated in the ordinance, use the money from the dissolution of the township for property tax relief, that dog won't hunt. I fully realize the ordinance proposes an advisory referendum, which is not binding on all involved. Gardner stands willing to sit down with the city and work out in good faith the solution to the issues presented or sought to be presented here. But I would ask each of you to vote no on this proposal. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is uh, Gary Budd. <laughs> Alderman McMenamin. Yeah, just um, sure. in response to uh, some of the information that's been put out here, we learned prior to this meeting tonight that there are no township roads within the corporate limits of the city of Springfield. There are no township roads within the corporate limits of the city of Springfield. So to the extent these 1,390 partial owners are paying a, a, a road tax to the, to the township, they're paying for something that, for which they do not receive any benefit within the jurisdiction of the city of Springfield. So that uh, just has to be, I think that was very helpful information we got from our public works department today, Mr. Mayor. And uh, to that point, uh, I know Gardner Township, and I'll allow Mr. O'Keefe to come back up if he wishes, but uh, I know there's uh, individuals that called our office that they pay a road and uh, bridge tax, which is, uh, you know, this particular person pays about $470 a year and then the Gardner Township tax is about $135. And again, as Alderman McMenamin said, we, we've taken over those roads and maintained those. So, yeah, Gary, sorry. Well, my name is Gary Budd and, and some of you know me uh, in this, but let me explain a couple things to you. I've been around Springfield my life since 19, uh, my dad and mom moved here in 1960. Been a North Ender my whole life. Raised at 15th and Converse, Langford Ballpark. Have lived on the North End my whole life since then. Lived in Springfield Township for about right at close to 40 years. Probably a little older. You guys can't take care of what you got. I mean, it's a proven fact. It, and and you, you put an ad in the paper Sunday that you uh, want to put out bids to help you plow snow. Joe, I disagree with you because I think there's a couple of roads in Springfield Township that you may, that we, we do take care of. I don't but have don't them in front them of me them. tonight. I wasn't ready for that. But we have what the city doesn't have, and that is we have general assistance in Springfield Township. We have our own assessor. The city of Springfield doesn't. And our assessment usually is a little cheaper than we living in the city. We don't pay this much in property taxes. I personally feel that what the people get from the Springfield Township, and I can't speak for the others, you get more for your money than you think you do for your buck. You get a lot more. We have a dumpster program that's open during the week in the first Saturday of the month that those people take and get advantage of, and they do take advantage of. We also have a Christmas, a food basket that we give out, out in December, which we do get people in that areas that you're talking about that come in December that will get this. There's services here that you guys don't give, that you get in these townships. Look, we do our job. We do represent those people. 
and they do call us and ask for help. I'm asking for a no vote because you're going to take, if it's the way the Corporation Council said, and I'm going to quit real quick, you're going to take almost 20% of Springfield Township. We have approximately 2,700 households. If you take over 600, we're down to around 2,000. That's a huge cut, guys, huge cut in Springfield Township. We try to do our best and live within the means that we have. And trust me, we don't get sales tax. We don't get none of that. We live off of what we replacement tax and property tax. And I'm proud to say we do a good job. All I got, guys. Mr. Mayor. Any questions? Mr. Mayor. Alderman Gregory. Uh, thank you. I, I, I met with you uh, uh, yesterday, I do believe. Yes. And, and you know, uh, and, and I agreed to listen to everybody. And, and, and I think the, the main thing is, is that we already have annexed these properties in, so they're really spring for properties. However, these townships have found a loophole and they're double taxing the citizens. That's not right. And we at least should be able to put it on the, the uh, ballot for those for the for our citizens to give their opinion on whether that's right or not. Okay. Don't you think that's real quick here on that, uh, Sean? Mm -hmm. My question to you is: Does each township get a right to put this advisory on a township ballot for the people to have the right? to vote against this too. And if that's the case, I was at State Board of Elections yesterday, have a pamphlet that's about this thick from them, and we gotta go through a loophole to get it on the ballot if we can even make it in April. And if not, you know when we get to vote on it? November of 24. You're two miles down the road before we get out of the starting block. I understand. I, I, I mean, if, if this was reversed, would you think it would be fair for you guys own property and we tax. Your yes, business. because we do a lot for those people. We do a lot for our citizens too. We got some I understand people. that. But these just, people I'm do do that. come to our township and use our dumpster program, to use our food giveaway program, to use our general assistance. Uh, there's a lot there, guys. There's a lot more than I think that every one of you realize here. Townships are good government. I think the issue is we're just trying to, you know, take care of our citizens and save them a little money, you know, on, on from, you know, the double tax thing. That's what it sounds like to me. And, you know, I think that's a fair um, question to be asked to the people like we talked about. At least we could do is ask the people what their thoughts is. Okay. Thank you. I didn't know if Dan Smith or Capital Keep wanted to come up. Or Dan Smith. I didn't know if he wanted to come up or not. No, I just didn't know if uh, Dan Smith had signed up as well, so I just didn't know if there was additional comments or not. Cap's speaking for me. Oh, okay. Thank you. Very good. We okay? We are. That's good. Well, Thank you. I can do a little soft shoe. <laughs> Please. Is there any other discussion? All in favor of the uh, motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the motion passes, six voting yes, four voting no, and one voting present. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is number 2022-377, an ordinance approving the location of sketch map of Isles Junction West Subdivision for the Office of Public Works. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2022-377 on final passage. So moved. Thank you. Been moved and second. Any discussion? Oh, Mr. Mayor, can we do a, an omnibus vote on this ordinance in the next two? Yes, three, 
377, 378, and 379, please. Second. Omnis vote has been requested for 377, 378, and 379. Uh, and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Agenda item 2022-378, ordinance regarding the variance request of section 155.158B2 pertaining to lots and lot arrangement for Isles Junction West Subdivision for the Office of Public Works. And agenda number 2022-379, ordinance regarding the variance request of section 153.157L pertaining to the restriction of access in Isles Junction West Subdivision for the Office of Public Works. Chair will entertain a motion to place those agenda numbers on final passage. So moved. Second. Second. And move and second. Any discussion? Alderman McMinimum. Mr. Mayor, I'm not going to get into the weeds on this because we kind of voted on this uh, almost four years ago. Um, I'm against this because we're going to do some curb cuts where, from my research of the legal paperwork going back to Mayor Hacera's time period, I don't think we're obligated to make those curb cuts um, in an area that I dot um, was against the curb cuts. Uh, but I don't want to rediscuss this whole issue, but I'm just going to be consistent with my vote four years ago. Thanks, vote, Joe. And therefore vote no. Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Voting is now open. Alderman Desenzo. Oh, sorry. And the ordinance is passed as eight voting yes, one voting no. Next item on the agenda is 2022-380, ordinance authorizing a supplemental appropriation in the amount of $9 million for the Office of Public Works. Chair will entertain a motion. Place agenda number 2022-380 on final passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion or the ordinance? Uh, Vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes eight, nine voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is 2022-397. Oh, we already did that one. Sorry. Next item on the agenda is 2022-403, an ordinance amending ordinance number... 299-07-22 by continuing to provide financial assistance on a matching basis of 50-50 matching basis except those applicants who earn 80% or less of the median income as established under HUD guidelines, financial assistance would be provided on a 10% to 90% matching basis for the exterior rehabilitation program. Utilizing the Far East tax increment finance funds for the Office of Planning and Economic Development. Chair will entertain a motion place agenda number 2022-403 on final passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Chair will entertain a motion. Proposed amendment number one. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, discussion, uh, Corporation Council, if you could go over the amendment, please. You, you may recall that uh, there was a discussion at the committee meeting uh, with uh, this being reviewed with a proposed amendment that's been reduced to writing that has been uh, provided this evening. Uh, essentially, it provides for uh, increasing the amount to not to exceed 25,000. It does increase the initial program to uh, 2575, then with a 10, 9, a 10 to 90 ratio based on certain income guidelines. Uh, it does provide for a uh, up to a $10,000 down payment assistance program for uh, purchasing homes that may be combined with the program. However, the total may not exceed $25,000. Uh, there was also a discussion to extend the program to the SHA Pillsbury TIF. Um, and there's a separate ordinance because we've always presented them for each, uh, uh, for each uh, uh, TIF that would be added tonight, a, a separate ordinance for first reading. But paralleling exactly what you have before you. So the amendment clarifies certain eligibility and also uh, increases uh, certain levels of eligibility uh, as discussed at the committee meeting. 
Alderman Gregory. I just uh, it's, it's just a, a typo on the uh, on the screen. It says 50-50. It should be 25-75, and as well as on the paper, but it is correct in the in the uh, details. Very good. Okay. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Any other discussion? Yes. Uh, so Alderman can, Williams. Can you please uh, <coughs> tell me again why they were separated out? Um, ordinarily, we uh, when we have presented programs for the TIFs. Okay. Um, we, for example, the initial one for Enos Park was a separate individual program ordinance for that TIF. Then there was a separate one for the Far East TIF. Uh, so traditionally what we've done when they're dealing with different TIF uh, districts, different TIF programs, we've put them in individual ordinances. So you have a separate ordinance uh, that is on first reading for tonight that parallels uh, what you're discussing right now. But for the... Uh, SHA Pillsbury tip that's to be added to the agenda for first reading Okay, well, I, I'll, we'll talk later. Okay. okay, is that all right Alderman or oh, yeah, would you rather no, it's just fine. Uh, no, I, just, I think it's, it's more of a it, It's fine because it's parallel, but I you know I just recently been getting calls you know, from Pillsbury area that you know They say Alderman Williams. We appreciate you trying to help us with the 1090 um, But we're 80% rental and, and I never knew that. They said we're between 80 and 85 percent rental. So these places you're trying to fix and improve, we still can't. But that, but that's why I said I'll talk. I'll talk with you later. We, but but I appreciate getting what we we're going to get. And you know, like them, I'm happy about that. But I found that amazing when when they explained that to me. Yeah, actually, it'll work out better splitting them up because you'd yes. be able to yes. try to address that you know, yes. when it's. Uh, and, Introduce to the council. And, 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 and there, there has been, a, a, to, to help here a little bit, uh, what the mayor indicated is correct because you may recall that there's been these prior programs, but then there has been follow-on amendments that, for example, make adjustments and so on based on what's, uh, you know, what becomes uh, known from the applicants. So you have the opportunity in each of these instances, Enos Park, Far East TIF, and also SHA, to adjust the program. You know, based on what what you deem uh, is appropriate. Thank you, Alderman McMinimum. Just a question: uh, What's the uh, source of funding for this program? Walk on TIF. TIF. It's come from the TIF. Yeah. Far East and okay. SHA. Yeah. I think uh, in the uh, maybe I got this wrong, but I wasn't here last week. But in the in the uh, analysis sheet for the ordinance, I thought it said Fund 001, which would be the corporate fund, but it's coming from the TIF. Okay, we, thank you. We'll double check to make sure there's not a typo, but it, these are each of these are TIF tax increment finance programs for Thank rehab. You. But we'll check. We'll double check that. Alderman Gregory, I just I just want to say, well, you know, when when um, I did think about our, our home ownership in in you know the total east side, so that's you know that's why I wanted to put that 10 percent um, up to ten thousand dollars to help buy some of the homes. Um, you know, in, in these we have citizens both in the. You know, I represent some of uh, the Pillsbury area too, and and so the goal is to create and promote more home ownership in, in the various homes that um, people live in. We have people in you know have have been written for five, ten years, and um, you know hopefully they'll move to to purchase the homes that they love and they've been staying in so long, and you know move into that. Hopefully they'll have property owners that will want to work with them on that. Um, and so that's the goal, and and, and I realized that, um, and I thought that was a way to. To, to help um, all parties, even those who don't own a house. I don't own my own house either, so I, I, I get it totally. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. All in favor, or um, there's a motion to, uh, on the ordinance as amended. And it, is there a motion for that as amended? So moved. Second. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion on that? All in favor of the motion as amended, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Voting is now open. Oh. And the ordinance as amended passes nine voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is 2022-420, an ordinance authorizing an agreement with Norfolk Southern Railway Company, LLC, in the amount of $5,181,000 for the future purchase, sale, and exchange of real property, SR0136, relating to the 
Springfield Rail Improvement Project for the Office of Public Works for Emergency Passage. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2022-420 on final passage. So moved. Second. The move and second. Any discussion? Alderman McMinimum. Uh, Mr. Mayor, this seems unusual. Like maybe that's a fair word, fair word to use. Uh, this is on emergency passage, um, and if we don't pass it, uh, the cost goes up. How did we get so far behind where it has to be on emergency passage for a $5 million spending for something, a project that's been in the works for um, eight years? I don't understand that. Yeah, we actually started negotiating with them back in 2019 and made our initial offer. However, we got stalled for, for, for a little while and we're going back and forth. They ended up getting a, a legal team involved. Um, however, they have been good partners um, for, for the most part over, over the length of the project. And it, it's towards the end of their third quarter and they need to basically have it to clean up their books uh, basically by September 30th. And unfortunately, we've been waiting for the paperwork from them. They were a little late in getting it. So we, we finally got the paperwork that we needed, um, and, and now we have it. And and they said basically, if we get it closed by then, by September 30th, then uh, we wouldn't get the five percent increase in the cost, um, which would be an additional two hundred and fifty-eight thousand dollars for the entire project. So we're trying to basically save save. So the it project seems kind of heavy-handed to me that Norfolk and Southern is putting pressure on us and saying if we don't approve this right this minute, they're going to try to get more money from us. Um, when was the appraisal performed on this property and, and who was the appraiser? Uh, the appraisal was done way it's before, I, I want to say in like September. I'm Steve Warren, Steve Warren with Hanson. I'm sorry. sorry. With Hanson. I'm sorry. Uh, the appraisal was done probably in, I want to say in April of 2019 and, the offer, and it was done by uh, an appraiser from the Chicago area that is used to dealing with um, railroads. Okay, railroads. are we going with the appraised amount on this ordinance? The appraised amount was only for purchasing the property. Okay, it didn't include relocation, and you know this this particular property owner, NS, they're both eligible for both acquisition and relocation. This extra amount is to really um, relieve us of any relocation uh, payments, and it's I. <laughs> I mean, I can I can go through facts and figures, but it's it's really um, a good deal. Well, I, I I just find this highly unusual that something the amount this large with an appraisal three years ago, and all of a sudden it gets to our desk right now at this point in time. I don't know if the problem is Hanson or Public Works or Norfolk and Southern, but Norfolk and Southern is putting pressure on us to to pass this, or you know they'll up the charge. Um, I, I, there's something that doesn't seem right here to me. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, it was very last minute. It, our hands were a little tied, and I know that they have their third. I don't know exactly how their accounting works and getting it done before the third quarter. They, they are were pushing us on it. Um, we did go back and forth. Um, the initial, the initial counter offer was 16 million dollars from them. They did show some supporting <laughs> costs for cost to cure, basically to do sightings uh, in the in the range of ten million dollars as well as some other um, some other things and it is a unique uh, land act purchase mm -hmm. usually you're not purchasing from the railroad so that that did make it a little unique but I, I agree they, they were very slow they were very slow along the way we've been all trying right. to push them along the way and then all of a sudden it was hurry up and get it done unfortunately and I apologize for that is this property does it include what used to be called the transfer yard of Norfolk and Southern that's correct. Yeah. That's the, about approximately 8.4 acres, basically, yeah. and that's, that's the area. And so will the city of Springfield then own that property, uh, the transfer yard? It'll be ours. It won't be IDOT's or any other entity. Is that correct? That's correct. The remainder will be ours. A uh, portion will be, obviously, for the Union Pacific uh, corridor, which I think is an entire 14 acres. But mm -hmm. a portion will be for Union Pacific, and then a portion will be for the Norfolk Southern um, remainder for the tracks to go through and then we will have the remainder basically to the to the east and then there's also a portion to the west by Mervis uh, Mervis supply and the SMTD station that that's being purchased you well. have a rough idea of what amount of acreage Absolutely. is left over that will not be taken up by the quarter the rail quarter yeah I think it's eight, eight yeah about 8.4 I believe 
Okay. So that's some valuable property. One acres in fee simple, and then point oh two eight acres in permanent, permanent easement. easement. Yeah. Okay. Well, I feel uncomfortable with this, but it, it is what it, it is, and it is all being reimbursed um, through the through the project. Mm -hmm. So it's no, no city funds. We're just okay. managing the project. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. <coughs> those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open for emergency passage. And the ordinance passes 11 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is 2022-421, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement with the Board of Education of Springfield School District 186 regarding school safety officers from August 15, 2022 through June 2, 2023 for emergency passage. Chair will entertain a motion place agenda number 2022-421 on final passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? Alderman Gregory. I just I just want to say this. I, I think this is a good thing for our schools. Um, definitely, and, and and I hope that we can bridge this with our focused deterrence and and and, and um, work together to try to do some of that. He ain't got to come up here. It's all good. I just oh no, we like to put him on the spot. <laughs> okay, we'll save it for later. Alderman uh, Redpath. What's the finances on this? Are they reimbursing our the police officers or how that's working? Changes to this from the past agreements is just redoing what we've done in the past where they do reimburse um, for some of the salary. I don't believe any of the fringes for the three officers that are in the high schools. So, so they are financially handling this? Yes. Okay. That's my understanding. <laughs> Julie's over anything's up. changed in we'll this clarify. From, uh, from past years. Right. <laughs> is it Corporation Council? Say that again, Julie. I didn't hear you. Roughly seventy-five percent of four officers. Seventy-five percent of four officers. Yeah, there's a worksheet that's attached to the ordinance to give all the total fringes and things, but I will confirm that to have the officer. Do we have the sheet? Yes, it's, it's, in, it's in your attachment the, up there on in the, the corner. On your Chuck. Oh, okay. Chuck on your computer. That's right. Oh, it's on the computer. He good. He good. Under attachments. I can't hear you. It's an attachment on your computer okay. up in Click the right hand corner. It says attachment. All right. PDF. Seventy five percent. Okay. And I mean, I believe just for clarification, it's it's the same as it's always been. In other words, the program's been in place for uh, multiple years, so there it's the same formulation as been in the past, is my understanding. And so this is this is a higher back situation, and it's not. Uh, no, 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 these are our school resource officers that okay. are assigned to the high schools. Not any any additional. No. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor of the ordinance, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes, nine voting yes, none voting no. Chair will entertain a motion to suspend the rules and place on first reading agenda number 2022-422, an ordinance authorizing the acceptance of RFP PW23-21 for an agreement with Clean Harbors Environmental Services, Inc., an amount not to exceed $115,000 for household hazardous waste collection and disposal services for a one-day collection on October 22nd. 2022 for the Office of Public Works. So moved. Second. The move and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to suspend the rules and place on first reading agenda number 2022-423. Ordinance accepting the lowest responsible bid and authorizing execution of contract number PW23-08-56 with Parkland Environmental Group, Inc. for the demolition of 36 residential properties in an amount not to exceed Four hundred eighty thousand seven hundred dollars for the Office of Public Works. So move. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to spend the rules in place on first reading agenda number twenty twenty two four twenty four, ordinance authorizing the creation of an exterior and interior rehabilitation program, 
and for homeowner down payment assistance utilizing SHA tax increment finance funds an amount not to exceed $350,000 for the Office of Planning and Economic Development. So move. Second. The move and second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed aye. say nay. Motion carries. Is there any unfinished business to come before the council? Yes. All the women purchase. Thank you, Mayor. I want to start off with the positive news. We had an amazing turnout for our 34th annual um, Edwards Place Art Fair and um, an enormous amount of foot traffic for our Enos Park home tour. Um, I do want to thank everybody for coming out. The weather was pretty sizzling, but we made it through <laughs> with drinks. And I think I got a little bit of a suntan. And then going over to um, some of the negative news, but still look at it a little positive. The tragic incidents that happened throughout Ward 5 this weekend was really unbearable with the phone calls, the text messages from the shooting downtown to literally um, having a shooting right a block away at the park in Enos Park. And I'm happy that this individual is okay but um, nobody should have to feel unsafe at two o'clock in the afternoon with their child in the park and get hit with a bullet. So we're like lucky that that's not a life that's lost. Um, you know, I just want to say that we're, we are being proactive. I think what we're doing in the neighborhoods with these police walks, walks are um, building a trust with the community but we're going to actively do more. And I spoke with Chief Scarlett and Chief Josh and asked them to come up tonight to talk briefly about it and was speaking with the mayor about more proactive measures that we can take downtown. Saturday night, I was at Buzz Bomb. We had a very huge presence of officers that I spoke with. They were around, but when you have something like a drive-by, you just never know where a bullet is coming from. And we're so lucky when you see 17 rounds going off downtown that that wasn't 17 people dying. Um, I did speak with uh, Alderman Purchase and the mayor this week uh, regarding the shootings, uh, the incidents that occurred. Um, I don't want to get too far into the details on what we know about the downtown shooting, but um, we are working with the bar owners to hopefully get a little more information about some of the events that they are bringing in to downtown, especially the later ones. You know, we don't have these issues with the earlier events, the festivals and those type of things. It's the uh, late night um, concerts and things that are occurring at those um, bars. And so getting some information about when those are occurring so that, uh, you know, maybe we can increase enforcement, um, not just in the downtown area, but, you know, these type of events tend to draw crowds in from outside the city watching some of those corridors and uh, increasing our enforcement efforts there, along with Illinois State Police, who has assisted in the past. Um, and uh, just having a presence down there and working with the bar owners to also possibly have some off-duty officers or additional security for their events when they are having those larger events. Thank you, and I know that um some of the neighbors in the surrounding area of Enos Park is asking, are we going to have extra patrol just not knowing what happened because they felt it was an intentional uh, incident that took place? Um, and these are people that's watching tonight to hear from you because I told them you would be speaking. Uh, you know, we will, I feel like we have a, a presence in Enos Park a lot, you do. but we will continue to keep that, uh, those numbers of officers in those areas up. Um, the incident in the park, from what we understand, is that there was a some sort of argument that occurred. Uh, one of those subjects maybe was already armed while in the park, and uh, another subject retrieved a firearm from a car. And these are, you know, why we continue to push our officers out there, and they are doing an amazing job recovering firearms. You know, this year, I know we've said it, every time we've been up here, we're going to, you know, recover more firearms this year than we did last year. And last year was a record year for us. You know, we continue to make arrests. Uh, the officers are out there. They're using the tools that you all have funded with Flock and with ShotSpotter to help make those arrests and identify suspects. And uh, we are very successful at that. You know, we're not gonna catch everyone and uh, continue to ask for the community's support and help with identifying those individuals. Thank you. Yeah, that's a key component someone knows something they should let us know so 
we can stop it from happening again with that particular individual. We had one of those this week where, you know, and, and it happens a lot where people call and say, I know someone who's got a gun. Um, we got it turned over. The gun turned out to be stolen, um, I believe, out of Kentucky. Um, so, you know, those are things that definitely help. You know, that could have been a shooting that was prevented because someone called and reported it. Or someone calls and say they see suspicious activity, something that doesn't look normal in the area. Absolutely. So any questions for the assistant chief? Well, uh, mine, Alderwoman Desenzo, and then we'll go down the line if thank you. you do my, have something for it. Mine does go along with this. Um, Alderwoman, I'm sorry this was your initiation into this, but those of us that have been sitting around the horseshoe uh, have all dealt with it multiple times. And... It's horrible. It's horrible. It's an awful feeling. You have no control over it. Um, my first experience with it was when a 12-year-old accidentally shot a, and killed a 13-year-old. Um, that was my first experience. So, you know, we, I don't know what we do as a community more than what we're doing. Um, but I did have an incident in my ward last night where I keep trying to get information from the Springfield Police Department and I can't get it. So I have concerned neighbors, concerned citizens, this is a low crime area, and I've asked multiple times from last night through today, and I can't get the information. So I can't reassure my neighbors what's going on in their neighborhood. And I've brought this up before, and I understand if there's an investigation going on, I get it, and they get it too. But you have to give them something because otherwise they're just wondering, you know, well, am I in danger? Can I, my kids go out and play? I mean, what's going on here? So there has to be some sort of increased communication. Um, it's very frustrating. It's frustrating for me. It's frustrating for the neighbors. And we, we've got to do something to make sure to open the lines of communication between the Springfield Police Department and the neighborhoods that are affected when, when something happens. And it might be something that's none of their business, but they, they, at least we can tell them that. You know, and I don't know specifically um, what your situation is. I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards and maybe we can... Uh... The chief knows and Officer Musson knows, so... Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it was about two weeks ago we had an incident um, where there was a threat called into one of the schools. Um, we had, you know, and we were out in front of that. We've had media um, notices going out. We had the subject downtown with a rifle. So we are, I feel like, doing better at that. And I think there's always room for improvement and we will continue to work to get those messages out to the community when appropriate. Yeah, I think it's helpful if, uh, if the public knows if it's an isolated incident or if, you know, if the person knew the person. I think, um, or if I it's a mental health issue. I mean, right. that's a lot of those are, this is a Whatever mental health share. emergency. And that, that kind of tells the person, the neighborhood, that, okay, this is one person that's suffering so, something. And they're going to get help. The police are there to help them. No one else in the neighborhood is, you know, threatened. Um, we have to do a better job of that because we are on alert all the time. Mm -hmm. And text messages. I mean... People have no problem texting us at 3 in the morning or at 6 in the morning. Or right? it's just, you know, we get, and we get it. We understand. We represent, you know, our residents. But it, when we, don't, we, have, we have nothing to tell them, it's, it, it's incredibly frustrating. Alderman <coughs> McMinimal. Assistant Chief, thanks for uh, being here tonight. Uh, regarding the 5th and uh, Washington incident, um, 17 plus rounds fired. Um, you're going into this and trying to determine the source of the problem, um, where it came from possibly and so forth. And I, I know we've got two surveillance cameras there at the corner of 5th and Washington. And my question is, um, w when do you think you'll have enough information to provide additional um, reporting to the city council. You know, I hate to put a timeline on that, you know, to specifically, um, and for me to give you any of the details might mm -hmm. provide a little too much for, let people know a little too much about uh, what we're looking into, and I just am not prepared to do that tonight, and I'd be happy to talk with you after, but uh, I don't think in a 
So are we talking days, weeks? What, what are we talking? You know, I can't answer that, sir, at this time. It's, you know, an investigation, you know, those are difficult at times when... Uh, are you making progress? <laughs> there is progress that is being made, and, uh, you know, as I stated earlier, we're using, uh, you know, the tools that uh, you all have helped fund, and uh, there is some success there, and I just don't want to go any further than that at this time. Well, I'm glad you're using all the tools that we try to provide, and um, uh, we appreciate the detective unit uh, doing everything they can do to get to the bottom of this. So thank you, Assistant Chief. Thank you, sir. Alderman Gregory. Thank you, Chief. Uh, and, and thank you, uh, Alderman DeCenzo, for that, because that was you know, going to be my exact sentiments. You know, we, you know, um, gunshots and, you know, death, quite frankly, is no no stranger in, in, in the community I represent. And, you know, we've, we've made a long, a lot of strides. And, you know, I, I just try to keep um, pressing that, you know, uh, um, this violence prevention piece, I, I, I would love to see uh, more walks in, you know, the east side community. Um, that railroad track is a true barrier. You know, it, 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 a lot of times, man, you know, for our community, you know, we, we go through this all the time. And, you know, when it happens elsewhere, it's just so much attention on it. And, and, and I talked to a mother last night, and, you know, we're going to talk about this, but she's so frustrated because she, she, she knows nothing about her son's death. And she just keeps crying and crying and crying. And that's what bothers me the most is, is talking to the mothers. The 10th, the 10th Street, I was on scene for that triple murder. People I know I've worked with all my life. I'm from here. And so those are the things that, that, that really bother me is the, is, the, is, the, is the parents, the mothers, you know. And, and you know, for our community, I just, I just hope that, that we don't get left out as far as uh, the community engagement. I'm not talking about just patrols, and I commend you guys on, on getting guns off the street. I've supported uh, Shot Spotter and every tool that we need to, to get illegal guns off the street. Um, but, but I do think that, that we have an opportunity to do more in our community and, and um, have a more of a, a, a I don't want to say friendly presence, but a, a, a different presence than arresting people or for guns and things in, in, in this community. Um, and I'll help any, any type of way I can. You guys do do that when I speak on it. I, I just don't want to speak on it. I don't want to be there. I don't want to take pictures. I just want to see it in our community other than just pulling people <laughs> over and stuff like that. So I appreciate it. You know, that has been a uh, focus of mm -hmm. the Springfield Police Department. It was under Chief Winslow and it continues and even increased under Chief Scarlett, you know, our opportunities to get out into the community with uh, meet and greets, bridging the gap barbecue. We've got a uh, thing we're doing with Shot Spotter coming up in October um, that uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, give some information about in the coming weeks. And that will include not just the police department, but other city agencies to get involved and uh, out in the community. So those are things that we focus on. And I appreciate it. Thank constantly you. improving. Appreciate you. Oliver Williams. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you. I, I, on, on weapons, on guns, uh, you know, I think the majority of the community uh, understands when it's under investigation, you can't talk about it. And, you know, there has to be that time period to allow you to do your job or the detectives to do their job. But where the frustration is coming in is on the weapons, the guns. When the 16-year-olds one killed the other, and the other one shot the other one, and, and they're 16. So I'm like, when's the newspaper going to say, here are who owned the gun? This is how they got. We never hear about the actual weapons. And I'm sitting there arguing with the Neighborhood Association going, well, I get emails, and it shows me pictures, you know, of, of confiscate. Well, we need to find a way to, once we identify those guns, or, or is there a law? Maybe there's a law that doesn't allow you to publicly say, you know, this gun belonged to this parent, or this is how this 16-year-old got the gun. I mean, I'm not saying, I may be asking for something that's illegal. I mean, maybe you're the corporate Might counsel. No, answer your question. Um, we do look at that. You know, I mentioned the one that was stolen out of Kentucky that we covered this week. Another incident, a uh, shot spotter incident. We were alerted to a uh, backyard. Officers came into contact with a subject who was still armed. Um, that gun turned out, I believe, to be stolen out of St. Louis. Um, so, you know, a lot of times it's a stolen 
firearm, which you know doesn't really help us in your situation. Um, for every firearm that we recover, mm -hmm. we run a trace through the ET ATF on, and we have an ATF officer agent a liaison who is embedded within the Springfield Police Department. He has an office with our investigators, and that is a, a piece of every investigation is identifying where those guns come from, trying to identify sources if there's someone out there who is purchasing guns, um, straw purchases to provide them to uh, subjects or gang members. You know, that is something that we work with. We work with the gun stores in the community to uh, identify those individuals. And I mean, I think all those things are great. I, I'm just asking for publicity on where the gun comes from to the public. Well, which parent did not take care of that gun and safeguard that gun that the kid got a hold? Or, yeah, he tried to keep it safe, but the kid stole it. Uh, we don't get enough stories like that. So it seems like kids can have guns in Springfield, and they can shoot each other and kill each other, and then we don't ever hear that side of it. We hear about the firm rolling, you know, all the other stuff. And I'm just asking, is there a way to start um, identifying a gun owner who should have been responsible, no matter if it's in Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, you know, or is that against the law? It might be against the law. I'll have to take a look and let you know on that. I'm not Thank sure you. Appreciate you know, if that's you. something that we would want to get into or not. Yeah, well, I, I'm saying it would be a deterrence. I mean, if, if somebody in my family got a hold of my gun and committed a crime, and then I read in the paper or Illinois Time or something, look, such and such didn't take care of his gun. I mean, anything that would deter, I, that, that's very impactful in some communities, yeah, I'll say, because people will feel real bad that they didn't safeguard the gun. And, and, and I always say, well, maybe it's against the law. They can't tell us. I don't know that we would be able to identify the individuals, but we may be able to identify the relationship on okay. where the game came from. That might be that okay. we'll look at. All of them are purchased. Thank you, Mayor. I was just going to strongly encourage to um, piggyback and offer uh, Alderman Gregory, even though he said he don't want to do the pitches, I'm going to continue doing them. But I think that it gives some great positivity on the walks to show people of walking with the community and with your older persons, too. So maybe that could be implemented over there a lot more as well, too. You want me to speak? You can. Because, because. You know, I, I'm, I'm really, That's great I wasn't speaking on you. I'm speaking on my relationship with the police and how far I've come with them to even have this conversation with them. Yeah, that would be great. So, so listen, listen to me. So what I'm saying is has nothing to do with you. I'm talking about my own personal relationship and, I, and how I feel that sometimes they shy away from me and doing the things that you're privileged to do because I'm so much different. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying to you and saying to them is, I don't have to walk when I don't have to do those things, but my community deserves the same. That's all. Hmm. Nothing to do with you. Yeah, I started it with our, our MPOs are really, really important. And I had started something with Officer Tamir. I said, walk in Ward 5 Wednesdays. How about we go out and introduce ourselves and just walk up to some doors and have that friendly face. It's not us coming in a bad way and just introducing myself and introducing the MPO. And we just decided to get more officers involved. So I think that would be something good to move over into some of the other wards as well. But I know that I specifically requested a lot to say, hey, can we move around to different neighborhoods? And more of my ward is starting to see that, and they're asking, like, hey, we want you all in our neighborhood as well. Very good. Any other questions for A.C. Stunkel? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any uh, new business? Mr. Mayor. You want to talk about my Oh, all the women descent uh, Thank you, Mayor. Both Alderman Gregory and I probably all day yesterday had calls about the flooded underpass at Ash Street. Um, to my knowledge, it was impassable till three o'clock in the afternoon. It's a brand new underpass. Was it Laurel or, or Ash? It was Ash. Laurel. Laurel. So the even newer one. Um, as you can imagine, our residents were not happy with that at all. Yeah, um, so I guess there was a power failure basically and power went out and unfortunately it was fluctuating. And I'm not an electrical engineer by any means, so I apologize if I butcher something, Doug. But uh, um, basically uh, the, the thing that protects the pump from burning up um, shut down the pump 
and unfortunately it, it shut it down and we weren't able to get it fixed until until today which we had a bypass solution and we do have an extra part that uh, and we'll be able to fix it permanently uh, tomorrow but right now it, it did we did uh, figure out a bypass solution for it um, but that was kind of a freak accident. We've not had any issues uh, until today, and we've had numerous rains. We've had some large 50-year 50, 50 rains, but unfortunately, uh, it was kind of a freak accident where the, the voltage was um, basically off kilter, and it shut it down to, in order to protect the pumps, which is a very valuable asset. I understand, but you have to, under, you have to understand what Ward 6 has been through mm -hmm. with this rail improvement project and these closures. Um, disrupting their lives for the last several years, and then. I understand. This, I mean, th these aren't 50 year rains anymore. Let's call them what they are. These are monthly rains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now they but are. they are. Yeah. So um, I, I, I hope, I, I'm glad to hear that you've found a bypass and I hope we can, we don't have that problem again. I know it's not your fault, but I, I have to advocate for my ward. And I, <laughs> if I got that many calls about it, I'm sure Alderman Gregory got that many calls mm. about it. and. It was all over social media, which is very but, frustrating. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's a major safety improvement. Uh, you know, you don't have to wait for the trains. It's right. a lot safer for pedestrians yeah. as well. We have the separate. Not safe if you drown. So, yeah. Yeah. obviously, yeah. yeah. Yep, but uh, yeah, but we did get it fixed, and we, we have a solution too. And we know Thank if for you. some reason that happens, we can respond even quicker and have it working within a couple hours. I appreciate that. Thanks. How many gallons does that hold? Do you know? I do not know off the top yep. of my head. I didn't know if it's half the size of the other ones. Uh, it's it's like a, carpenter it's, it still has a fairly decent amount of storage just mm -hmm. the pump stopped working and we also had a large two and a half inch rain yeah. but it wasn't if, if the pumps were working it would have been able to handle handle right. it it's just unfortunately we had the the power outage and the voltage got off so yeah, if you could find out the retention gallons for each underpass that'd be helpful yep I can do that thanks Alderman Gregory? I just, real quickly, I, I think that's extremely important. I, I, you know, I was going to speak on that. Me and all the women de Sizzle did definitely spoke on that because, you know, I was under the impression on the call that it was flood proof. And, you know, I understand that, that issues do happen, but, um, you know, so quickly it just worries the constituents on the eastern part of the tracks and, you know, of, of, of being tracked. But none of the others failed. And, you know, I, I went around, I was actually – uh, driving down that one, and uh, it was kind of deep. Some people went through it, you know, some trucks and stuff, but I wasn't going to take mine through there. So, but um, thank you for the update, and you know, um, keep up the good work. Tell them to get it fixed. Thanks. <laughs> <Quick. laughs> Alderman Redpath. Uh, Nate, could you check St. Francis area? They said they were knee deep in water, and it's it's an area that's got <clears throat> bad sewer problems out there anyway. That's mm -hmm. south of uh, Stevenson Drive there, behind the Little Flower Church. Thank you. Look into that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Nate? Very good. Uh, any new business? What was new business? All the women purchase. Um, we have the Mother Road Route 66 this weekend, and it is going to be absolutely fun, and the weather is going to be amazing. So I encourage everyone to come out and see all of the cars and I'll be dressed up pretty vintage. And then also, too, we have um, movie night with the YMCA at the Edwards Place. Um, from 6 to 7, there will be um, games with the police department and the fire department. And then at 7.30, we will play our Disney movie. And you can bring your furry friends and your brothers and sisters and your parents and come enjoy the night with us. And it'll be in the 80s, so it'll be a nice night. Alderman Gregory? I just wanted to, um, I, I don't do this normally, but I, I did want to uh, um, let everyone know the style of hope is at the uh, uh, Bank of Springfield um, this weekend, or Thursday, um, and it's a benefit with entertainment to, to really um, help hope schools, youth, and, and things. Uh, um, I'll be modeling in it from some Shields gear. So, um, you know, the tickets are only $45, so come on out and support those um, young people. It's new. Yeah, modeling, man. Pass yeah, model man. if you need some tips. <laughs> That'll be worth the price of a at, at style. I home. need it. I need it. But no, it, 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 I really did. She did send that email to us. So I, I just wanted to uh, say that I think that's important. It's the first that I ever knew about it. So I, I, I wanted to get that out um, to our constituents. Thank you. Any other new business? Oh. All the women to send to? I just want to thank Amanda Long um, for going above and beyond today. She helped me out. She, I saw that she left, but she really um, 
help me out with something that had nothing to do with her. So I just wanted to give her a, a really cool. big shout out because she was she did great work today. Very good. Any other new business? We do have a few people that signed up. Margaret uh, Franklin. If you'd state your name and address for the council, we'd appreciate it. My name is Margaret Franklin, and I live at 1233 North 14th Street. Um, we gave each of you, older people, older persons, older, um, what I'm here about. My main concern is um, at 1208 North 13th Street. It's a residence. I know it's a residence because I used to live there. Um, right now, there is a business called PHP that is a tree service. They have taken up the entire block. You cannot even get, if you're going off of North Grant onto 13th Street, they've got one side of the street. There's people that live on the other side that has a garage, and they've got stuff out there on the side of the street. The road is very narrow anyway, okay? So last night, my husband and I were coming home, and there was a car that flew over the railroad tracks. I kid you not. And if my husband had not pulled over to the side, it would have been a dead head on. What I'm saying is that PHP has got no business running a business out of a residence. I have talked to Mr. Williams about it. As I said, there's a lot of things on here, but there's no sidewalks on either side of the street, so you cannot use sidewalks. Um, there's a roller tracks right there by their house. They've got that whole way taken up by a big old motor home. They've got all kinds of things. I just want to know, as a concerned resident of the neighborhood, why this is being allowed. Um, yeah, on that issue, real quick, he had passed it along, and the, uh, the chief or the police will go out there and take a look at it. But, well, uh, yeah, I drove by there the other day and saw the uh, number of trucks parked there. Oh, my God. There, there's, mm -hmm. there's big old trucks. I mean, like I said, there's a motor right. home there. Right. It's, it's unreal. But the other thing I wanted to know about is that we have a lot of um, addresses here on this piece of paper that need to be addressed. Um, we have some houses that need to be torn down that are burnt homes. Um, there is trash everywhere. Where we live, the alley right behind our house is where there's mattresses, there's chairs, there's unreal stuff in that alley. Well, of course, it's attracting rodents, <laughs> which we don't need any more of. But I'm just, with, the trash is, is unbelievable. But what I don't understand is why the city it's paid to come out there and pick up that stuff. Why are they not finding out who is fly dumping and get this resolved? That's all I'm asking for. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to continue to see the trash on North 14th Street. No, I'm not the neighborhood association president. I've been on his case <laughs> every day. So all I'm wanting to know is, is why that neighborhood right there at 13th and 14th is just like, I mean, yeah, I can call Mr. Williams. Sometimes I get a hold of him. Sometimes I don't. He did come over the other day. We addressed some things with him. But I would like to see our aldermen in our neighborhood a little bit more than what we do. Um, I would like to see him come over and personally, which he did the other day, um, after he was called to come over, to take a look at the stuff. He rode around. He's aware of what's going on. So all I'm asking for is that city council do something about our problems instead of us just being kind of neglected. And that's yeah, we'll how I have, feel. Uh, we'll give this list to public works, but we'll have them do a sweep of the area with regards yes. to that. We would appreciate that very much. <coughs> yeah, sure. Well, oh. Yeah, so, Mayor, if you would, please. I mean, I, um, so this, everything she said is pretty much on target. However, what, what I think she doesn't understand is a lot of this stuff is being dealt with as we speak of the burnt out houses, the, the demolitions, we've done more demolitions over there than anywhere else in my ward. And, and the thing I had to learn about demolitions that it's a legal process. Yeah. So it can be burnt up and sit there and sit there, but you, you're going through courts and you're dealing with ownership and it's just not that simple. So I think sometimes Ms. Franklin wishes it would be faster, but that doesn't mean that public works isn't 
you know, doing the processes on that. On this company here, um, it, it did amaze me as well. Uh, and Mac's not here, is he? Uh, but Mac is aware in zoning, and he's working on, on, on what's what, how's it zoned and all that stuff. However, that company's been there forever, it seems like. I know it's for as long as I've been up here, that company's been in existence. Okay, so I don't know why they get to operate that way, and maybe Gerald's going to tell us, so I'll let Public Works handle it from here. Well, first but, of all, but I want to say one thing to you as a constituent. So I, I couldn't stop you from coming, um, but, but I just feel like these kind of issues, uh, once the, the departments have them, um, I, I know a lot of my people, uh, is Alice here? You know, they think when they come and they say it, it's more impactful. And I'm trying to slow that down to say, give people a chance to do their jobs. Because half of this list I'm reading, I know between me and um, Richmond, what's his name, Chris Richmond with the mm -hmm. Pillsbury Group, we have all these address and work, and we know the schedules of the demolitions. And three have been done on North 14th, probably this summer, three came down. Uh, and, yeah, but see, you can't make it be demolished. It's a legal process. But I'll let Harris talk to it, mm -hmm. to you about it. Yep. Go ahead. The alderman, first of all, the first issue was 1208 North 13th, I believe you yes. spoke of. Uh, and as we shared with uh, not only the alderman, but also with the Franklins, is that at 1208 on September 16th, a letter did go out. We had first had to do an investigation. Uh, I don't know if you understand the zoning process, but if someone makes a complaint, uh, they say this trucks there and there's things there thank god we got a great um uh, team of, of, of union workers ibw barb in particular that had to go out there and wait and catch the person and catch the trucks and stuff and sometimes that's not done on normal work hours done later work hours early in the morning four or five o'clock in the morning to catch them to take pictures so we have evidence to present to the courts so we can move swiftly letter did go out to the particular violator at 12.08 North 13th on September 16th. The letter is out. The letter basically says four or five different violations and also states that they don't reply within a certain amount of day. It goes automatically to our court process. So again, our team of a great um, union worker for for ASME and IBW do a great, fantastic job. Once we have the complaints and stuff there, you gotta give us a little time <laughs> to catch them. And I think Conley's aware of that because we had a similar situation. <laughs> and sometimes we're not sharing everything with the club each and every step, but sometimes it's past working hours, sometimes way before working hours. The other items that you're talking about is correct. We have a, I think you guys just voted uh, for a RP that we have for demolitions. Many of the demolitions you talked about is in an RP. Uh, prior to that, as of, Jan as of January 1st, I think we tore down about 29 homes ourselves. Uh, starting of the year, we continue to tear down Glenwood. <laughs> Ooh, I was just waiting <laughs> some, on that. Uh, five years. Other properties. Took five years. Other properties, but Alderman Roy Williams, correct. Um, and a lot of times, it doesn't take phone calls from uh, a lot of times the resident, but Roy and myself have went up and down Pillsbury without anybody knowing and wrote up things and show, he showed me things and talked about things that we need to address. So did Alderman Gregory. I've done the same thing with other aldermen. Here as well, so our, we work hard to try to get these things done. But there's also rules in this processes. And a lot of times we do a violation, they still have seven days to abate. That means we're giving them an opportunity, giving them a warning, saying there's a particular problem there. We have seven days to abate. After that, we take over or we take it to the courts. That's the process. It gives everyone the opportunity. We want them to correct it. We don't use those, your tax dollars correctly if we can get the property owner to correct it. That's our way of doing things. I think it's a good, effective way. All the concerns of Mrs. Franklin and others, we get them. Our team takes a look at them. They automatically go on the system, and we're addressed that day. Within 24 to 48 hours, someone's out there taking doing an inspection. That's good, efficient government. Now, the particular area you're talking about, we looked at it about 35 to 40 type complaints within the last month or so. We addressed it. So a lot of times you say, well, I see trash. Well, a lot of times that's repeated. That's not something that we didn't go pick up. Sean knows for myself, we, we did a little sting deal. Like we picked up trash, and literally within three hours, 
There was more. But I did have pictures showing that we did pick it up. So again, work with us. We'll work with you as we always have. But anytime you have a complaint, call 789-2167 and we're on it. Well, Daryl, what I'll say Thank to you, you is that the, the, the fly dumping piece that she's describing is, is kind of daily. You have picked it up, mm -hmm. and then there's new fly dummies. So I, I, I haven't figured out if it's like certain trucks that, that charge these people, and they know they don't want to pay the dump price, so they found out they can go over there and just dump it. But it's just new dumping. And so I understand her frustration, mm -hmm. but she, I want her to understand that's not the same couch, that's not the same mattress. You know, and it happens more. This is a tough area. It's the same area I'm talking about on on this uh, SHA TIF. Uh, I'm always bringing up Pillsbury. Mm -hmm. I always talk about this area. It, it, it's you know, Sean wants to say he has the worst area, but I know Pillsbury <laughs> is the worst area. And we're trying to work hard on, on on changing Pillsbury. You know, as they get their new high school, Lanfear, and we start coming back south, all that's going to have to change. But and think, it starts with, with us doing this kind of stuff. I think one of the major problems we have, and we've been working with the county on this, is that there's only a few people that's licensed to haul and get rid of rap, refuge. Mm -hmm. But you're finding out a lot of finite type workers, I want to call them. The residents think they're getting a great deal because someone comes to them and says, I can take care of it for $20. Yeah, cheaper. Well, guess where that $20 goes to? It goes to some vacant lot or goes to somebody's property or it goes to someone's alley because right. they're not properly disposing of it. We only have three or four, I think, haulers that have the license to do so. Yep. But yeah, if you check the pages, you'll find there's a litany of folks saying that they can haul. Well, we appreciate your good work. Thank you. Yes, all the, we do. All, all the women Conley. Wait, Mr. Harris. Oh, see, you can't, <laughs> you can't run that fast. I, I'm sorry. Would it be possible for us to publish the list of the licensed haulers, at least on, on public works page, so that we can refer people to those... I'll work with Julia on that uh, okay. and, and talk about that. That's no problem. Yeah, it's, not, it's not that many, I can tell you that. So, yes, we could do that. It just, I mean, I'll it's because I, you know, I, I try to tell people mm -hmm. that all the time, you know, make sure you're dealing with someone who's licensed. And then, the, you know, the next question is who's licensed? Mm -hmm. And so, if we could have something to refer people to yeah. so that we can educate them and then they can know, you know, if you're not getting someone off of this list, you may very well be contributing to, you know, another part of our town's right. continuing problems. Right. <clears throat> Appreciate that very much. Right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dora. Thank you. Mr. Harris, I meant. Good idea. <laughs> Next we have is uh, Tashiana House. Bankhead. Good evening. My Good evening. name is Tashiana Bankhead. I reside in Ward 6. Um, thank thank you, you, Mayor Langfelder and City Council, for your time this evening. I am a community organizer with Faith Coalition for the Common Good. We would like to invite the mayor, city um, council, local officials, and the department chairs to a public CJA screening, which is no, um, no climate, no equity, no deal. This screen will take place next Thursday, September 29th, 2020. Last year, CJ, last year, Illinois made history by passing the most equitable clean jobs bill in the country, known as the Climate and Equal Jobs Act, or CJA. Now we're excited to share a new short film that documents all the work that went on to pass the landmarking legislation, which was organized by the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition, which Faith Coalition's a part of. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, CJA is the nation leading law that creates jobs in the clean energy economy for people of color, women, coal communities, and returning citizens. In the near future, Decatur, Champaign, and Peoria will implement job hubs for training for those who are interested in the new clean job industry, but especially for those living in coal communities. CJA protects public health from pollution, gives an opportunity for equal equality um, in solar, and the pathway to electrifying our transportation when it comes to personal transportation, school buses, and public. This film shows a promising future for our state and also for our city. So, Faith Coalition decided to host this event at the Illinois State Museum. Doors will open at 5.30 p.m. with the screening beginning at 6 p.m. The screening is about 20 minutes in length, so please be sure to arrive on time. There will be a short Q&A with the following of reception. 
There is no cost for this attendance. This is open for the community. And I have admission tickets <laughs> for each of you and for anyone who is interested in attending. And I want to thank you all for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you can pass those around if you like. Yeah. All right. That's cool. uh, next is Charlotte Johnson. Oh, you just want to put them we'll pass it for you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Tremaine Brown. Tremaine here. Is there a motion for adjournment? So move. Second. Second. Move and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. We're adjourned. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll look at this Friday. Thank you.